the fuck is Kenyon there? How you doing? What's that? No, he's on his way. Okay, good morning, everyone. The time being 9 a.m., I'd like to call our Judicial and Public Safety Committee meeting for Thursday, March 10th, 2022 to order. Uh, my name is Myrna Molina. I will be your chair today. I may have a roll call, please. Davis? Davis here. Brown? Brown here. Gums? Gums here. Leonard? Leonard here. Sanchez? Sanchez here. Shepro? Shepro here. Kirag? Molina. Melina present. You have a quorum. Okay, we have a quorum. Um, next item on our agenda is approval of minutes. Um, I'd like to defer our minutes from uh, February um, and make a motion to approve our January 13th, 2020 minutes. Council so second. Moves. A motion made by Mr. Leonard, second by Ms. Uh, by Ms. Gums. Any comments or questions regarding our minutes from January? Okay, roll call please. Brown? Brown, yes. Gums? Gums, yes. Leonard? Leonard, yes. Sanchez? Sanchez, yes. Jepro? Jepro, yes. Davis? Molina? Molina, yes. Passes. Okay. Um, do we have anyone signed up for public comment? Any public, anybody in the public wishing to comment? Okay. Um, we're going to do our agenda a little differently today. I know a lot of um, people are here listening and present um, regarding our presentation for the sales tax. Um, so we're going to do that at the end. We're going to get through our regular agenda and then we'll um, go into our presentations after. Um, so uh, next item on our agenda is our monthly financial reports. Um, they're on file if anybody has any questions. Um, and then we have our merit commission. Do we have somebody here from our merit commission? There's truly. Good morning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good morning. We just tested for corrections and uh, we had nine applicants take the test, four passed. One of the uh, 
people who did pass has an extensive police arrest record, so I doubt he'll go too far. So the sheriff is getting a list of three people, which is significantly down from pre-George Floyd of about 60 applicants. I don't know what we're going to do, I, other than we're testing again already in uh, May, May 5th, which is the quickest we've ever had to turn around. Uh, I don't know what the answer is. I do know there's a significant drop off in uh, applicants showing up with any kind of education dealing with law enforcement. We used to see 10, 20% of our applicants were from Western Illinois University, which is a cop mecca, or community colleges that offer law enforcement degrees. We don't see them anymore. And I, I don't know, and it's just my opinion that I think a lot of it's got to do with the sentiment out there about defunding police and moms seeing cops shot every other day and talk, talking their kids out of getting into law enforcement. So I don't know what the answer is, but we're going to just keep plodding along and testing. If we can do. Any questions? Any questions for our merit commission, Mr. Shepro? Question, Mr. Leonard first, and then I'll then you'll go, Mr. Shepro. Thank, Thank you. you, Madam Chair. Um, so I was wondering, is there any age discrimination? I don't mean for young, but I mean for older people. Um, too old, Bill. <laughs> well, it's kind of open, you know. <laughs> That would make you two old too. Uh, sheriff's departments across the state can, you could be 65, you could be 70. Oh, there you go. <laughs> City departments, I think, limit at 35, but okay. sheriff's yeah. departments are, there, there's no age limit. And we've had, we'll have people on this list who are in their 50s. Nice. Thank you. Mr. Shepard, go ahead. Yeah. Um, are there any, <clears throat> How additional efforts that you're making to reach out to potential applicants because the number is so reduced? Yeah, we're trying to set up programs with the two county uh, junior colleges to go out there and talk to their law enforcement classes. We don't seem to have the problem yet. We haven't tested for patrol. We won't be doing that until uh, next summer, I believe. But you. You mentioned Western as being kind of a big source previously of applicants. Have they done anything to cut back their programs or fewer people going into their programs? As, do you know? Not, my, not, I, not to my knowledge, sir. Thank you. But anyway, we're going, to, we're going to initiate, starting in the fall, a program with both Wabansi and uh, the college in Elgin to take a correction officer and one of us out there and talk about just corrections as a career. We'll see if that helps. Gums, Madam Chair. Ms. Gums, go ahead. Um, quick question. Do we have a requirement for um, education at this point or is that just a, a trend that we're seeing? High school or a GED. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for our merit commission? Okay, thank you for your report. Thanks. Okay, we will move on to our King Come. Good morning, Ms. Guthrie. Good morning, our monthly report is on file. I do have a presentation this morning um, regarding our annual report and, and some additional, we can wait until the end when we do all the presentations. Um, I, I, I don't think yours is related or? Somewhat, I mean, I can. Okay. I okay. can go now. That's fine. We can. Um, we'll we'll wait then. We'll hold okay. up the presentation and just kind of go them in order. And then you have a resolution. I do. I have a resolution proclaiming National Telecommunicator uh, Week April 10th through 16th. Okay. May I have a motion and a second to discuss and potentially approve? Leonard moves. Brown seconds. Okay. Motion made by Mr. Leonard, second by Mr. Brown. Any comments or questions? Mr. Brown. Madam Chair, the only comment I would have is um, I'm wondering if maybe. Madam Chair of the Board would entertain the idea with your permission to um, have this resolution presented at the County Board meeting and and maybe um, Melissa could attend it as well and, and whoever that works in that department in that area could attend as well. Absolutely, this this will go to the County Board and we'll, we'll be, we can always remove it from the consent agenda and do a, yeah. a small um, presentation just acknowledging it at the County Board meeting too. I think it's important as has been talked about many times with first responders and Michelle, I know you're online. So you'll probably want to jump in on this. 
the 911 dispatchers are our first responders and they don't often get recognized as that. Thank you. Ms. Gums. Ms. Gums, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, I appreciate that, Mr. Brunt. Um, I don't know if this is possible, but could we at this level um, supply them with a treat on a particular day during that week? Is that something we can we can navigate and get done? I think so. I think maybe um, if you could get together with Ms. Guthrie, we can put something together. I think our staff would appreciate that. Absolutely. Yeah, well, I, I, I will get together with her. I think it's super important. And again, um, we are still working on trying to get our, our 911 dispatchers reclassified as first responders as they sit now. They are not federally classified as first responders. So there is um, active um, lobbying to get that done. So they are recognized as such. And that with that brings a whole uh, other set of um, benefits and things that they would be entitled to. Um, oftentimes when you're a dispatcher, you don't get the, uh, the uh, credit for being that first responder, but um, literally they're, they're probably the most important position in the entire county. Absolutely. Maybe I'm a little biased on that. <laughs> we won't argue with that point. <laughs> Shepro, quick question to follow up on Ms. Gum's comments. Go ahead, Mr. Shepro. I was just wondering, is that reclassification something that has to be accomplished by federal legislation or federal administrative regulations? Or how does that, what has to happen? Yes, yeah, so there is um, there are proposals that have been put forth to get that done federally through both of those avenues. Um, it does have support, but, you know, continued support and continued pressure to get that done is something that I personally work on regularly, and I know our municipalities, and uh, I'm quite certain that Ms. Guthrie and, and the telecommunicators across the country are working to get that done, so. If it's legislation, perhaps it could appear on your committee agenda for support. You just turned on my light bulb over my head, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, just for the question or count. Do Mr. we know Davis, where the, ahead. thank you. Do, do we know where the, the pushback comes, where the main obstacle is to accomplishing this legislation? Bureaucratic inertia. Yes, well, well, that and um, gums again, um, there's a lot of, well, they're currently classified secretarial essentially, um, and people who don't understand the job simply think we, you know, that dispatchers answer the phone and put in data and it's uh, way more than that. So there's a, a grouping of people that, because with that reclassification comes added benefits. So of course that's <laughs> financial issues and people push back because they don't want to pay more. There we go, follow the money, got it. Absolutely. All right, great discussion, everyone. Um, so we have a motion in a second. Um, any other questions or comments regarding this resolution? Okay, may I please have roll call? Brown? Brown, yes. Gums? Gums, yes. Leonard? Leonard, yes. Sanchez? Sanchez, yes. Shepro? Shepro, yes. Davis? Davis, yes. Molina? Molina, yes. yes. Okay, this passes and this will move on to our executive committee. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, next item on our agenda is our sheriff. Good morning, Sheriff Hain. Good morning. If we're staying those presentations until after all of this, we'll just jump right to my uh, one resolution that okay. we have up. So uh, this resolution memorializes the retirement of K-9 Pharaoh handled by uh, now Sergeant Terry Hoffman. Terry has handled the dog since 2009. He's uh, served with two different dogs at the Sheriff's Office. So this just officially retires K-9 Pharaoh and sells the dog to Terry for a dollar. And uh, I would also like this to be pulled from the consent agenda uh, at the next county board meeting so we can recognize Terry for all of his years of service. Absolutely. May I have a motion and a second to approve this? Leonard Gums. moves. Brown a second. Yeah. I will let Ms., uh, Mr. Leonard move and Ms. Gum seconds. I know she has a love of dogs as well. <laughs> so um, <laughs> thank you. Okay. Any further comments or questions regarding this resolution? No okay. pension liability. <laughs> None? No. No? Zero pension liability for the dog. <laughs> for the dog. Yeah. Right. dog treats. I is there a, uh, have dog treats. <laughs> is there a replacement come in form? Uh, not at this time. So we have enough dogs right now. And so I'm closely monitoring their activity and call outs. And they're rapidly being equalized by our drone team as far as search and, uh, and arrest. So um, we're not going to replace that dog quite, quite yet. 
All right, any other comments or questions? Okay, um, I please have roll call. Brown? Brown, yes. Gums? Gums, yes. Leonard? Leonard, yes. Sanchez? Sanchez, yes. Epro? Epro, yes. Davis? Davis, yes. Molina, Molina yes. <clears throat> okay, this passes and this will move on to our executive committee. Madam Chair. Mr. Brown? I, I do have a question for the yes. sheriff, if I could. I take it um, from what I read in the newspaper recently that Wayne has hired a police chief, so we're not going to hear any more conversation about the sheriff's office taking control over that portion of the county. Boy, I hope so, but uh, <laughs> we'll see what direction Wayne comment. takes. There we go. Mr. Shepro, go ahead. I, that was I think that the hiring of the police chief is a precursor to the village board seeking a referendum to raise enough money to pay for the police. So uh, I would share the comment that the sheriff just made about hoping it's over, but I, I don't know that you could say it's that that's the case at this point. I think they're looking to put it on the June primary ballot. I don't know, Sheriff, if you have any further info on that, but I, I don't know that we can uh, relegate it to the back burner just yet. Yeah, Mr. Shepard, you, you obviously know more than I do, and uh, we've just been in a reactionary role the entire time. Uh, if they need us, they need us. If they don't, they don't. But it'd be great if they had their own police agency. Okay, any other comments or questions right now for our sheriff? Okay, um, we're gonna move on to um, Ms. Wolnick. She has a report regarding the water management plan for the Adult Correction Center. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Jody Walnick, Director of Environmental and Water Resources. Um, at the request of the state's attorney's office, we're here this morning to provide you an update on the water management plan for the Adult Justice Center. Um, that plan has been forwarded to the Illinois Department of Public Health. Um, in addition to that, we've had uh, several recent meetings of our water management team, um, and we have gone through both facilities and are in the implementation process of that plan. Um, I do realize that this committee has not been reported to before on this plan. We've been mainly reporting to the administration committee. Um, the plan itself is intended to provide a safe drinking water uh, in the facilities. Um, there's an additional plan that's for the juvenile justice center, um, and the plan involves monitoring the water system, um, testing the water system, um, flushing the water system, and reacting to any issues that arise in the water system. So I'm here to answer any questions if there are any. Okay, do we have any questions right now for Ms. Wolnick? Okay, thank you for keeping us updated. Okay, uh, we will move on to our state's attorney. Ms. Mosser, did you want to hold your presentation? Yes, please. Okay. Our monthly report is on file. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then we'll move on to our public defender. Ms. Quinnen, good morning. Good morning. Our uh, monthly report is on file as well, and I can hold off on the presentation. Okay. And then we're holding off on your resolution. Yes, that month. is correct. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So the resolution on uh, the agenda will be held for, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be deferring for now. Okay. Um, okay. And then judiciary and courts. Good morning, Judge Hall. Good morning, everybody. No report today. Okay. And Ms. Ost, good morning. Good morning. No report. I'll hold off for the presentation. Yeah. Ms. Barrero? Happy belated birthday. Thank you. Here to serve. I would like to say I'm not prepared since uh, this is moving so fast. Usually I have like another 45 minutes. <laughs> right. Got it. My report is on file. Everybody can take a look at that. I do want to mention that, um, as I'm sure you are all aware now, um, we have put out an announcement that our public portal is down. Uh, the Kane County Circuit Clerk's Office, along with the Kane County Technology Information Technology um, Department, is working diligently on that. We've received hundreds of calls. As a matter of fact, we've received 37, 33, 3,733 calls in the last nine days. So um, we apologize, but there's nothing, it's totally out of our hands. Uh, as soon as we get that back up again, we'll send out another notice for, for the public that it will be active again. So that's all I really have for today. Thank you, Ms. Burrow. And if um, people do need to access, we're so used to having technology at the palm of our hands. If they do need to access information that this public portal um, service has provided them, they're just calling your office. Is that the best number to call or how would we direct our Yes, they call, they call our office. Um, they can also come in and view uh, documents in the viewing room. 
So I would ask if they wanted to do that, that's public, that's public record, they have that ability. Um, we do have staff working on um, extra staff in that area for those that come in, but mostly it's phone calls right now. So um, this is, it's a public portal. It's unfortunate, but we're working on it. Thank you. Okay, Ms. any Jen comments, Shepro? Mr. Shepro? Yes, uh, Teresa and maybe Judge Hall as well. Um, I know you're limited about what you can say about this, but my understanding is, is that this is absolutely not a, the fault of any of the circuit clerks and that this is not a unique situation with Kane County, but uh, across most of the state. That is correct. There are clerks uh, working on this throughout the country, actually. Um, so it's not it's not just Kane County. Um, it, it is a public portal and um, other clerks are experiencing the same um, problem with it being down, but it is um, it's totally out of our hands. We have to um, follow you know, the internal process to get it back up again. And can I, can I just add on to that? Um, what I want to do, and I want to make sure it's clear and public, is that, uh, as Mr. Shallow yes. just said, it, it is not, it is not King I'm County. listening to the media. It is, it is not the circuit clerk's office. And so because people have become so accustomed to the access, uh, now that that access is not there, uh, it impacts a lot of people, and, and we're very sorry for that. Um, but what I want to make sure everybody's clear on is that it has absolutely nothing to do with Kane County, Kane County IT, Kane County Circuit Clerk. And uh, we're in one of those, as, as she had just said, the holding pattern is very difficult because we want that. To, it's easier for everybody when that works. Um, but again, I just want to make sure that, you know, I can't say enough about how hard, you know, Teresa brought this to our attention immediately when she knew about it. She, along with the state's attorney's office and county IT, have been keeping us up to date on this on a daily basis. And I really, again, that when we talk about teamwork, I can't thank Teresa's office enough for what they're trying to do to get us back up and running. So I know that there will be continued frustration. I know that we will all get phone calls about it. Um, but I want to just say thank you to her and her leadership and her office for trying to do, you know, the, the only thing we can do right now is she can communicate and she's doing that. And so we will continue to do that. But I just am so, I just want to, you know, stand on, stand on top of a building and say this has nothing to do with the Kane County Circuit Clerk. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Quick, appreciate that. Ms. Quick any other follow questions? Up. Mr. Shepard, go ahead. Uh, is there a ancillary effect of this national problem? I mean, uh, is it, I would guess it's making it more difficult, not only for litigants, but maybe for, court and staff to access records? Uh, no, they they have the ability they, to They do, okay. Yes, they have the ability, it's just the public portal. Um, they have the ability to access records. So Thank this doesn't affect- that the, explanation. Yeah, this isn't affecting the day-to-day -day no, work can, of, our, right. of our system. It's no. just the public who wants to see what's happening. Correct. Doesn't have access right now. Well, Correct. Okay. Well, and the only it, thing I would say about that is it does, it, Ms. Mosser and I were at the Kane County Bar Association criminal defense meeting yesterday. And I don't know if FSA Mosser wants to explain, but they, they were there and very alarmed because it's impacting them on a daily basis, which then in turn impacts us. So Jamie, do you want to add anything to that? So I think that the clerk's office is actually doing a great job of answering phone calls. And one of the defense attorneys did say that maybe they could do a better job of keeping their own schedules as opposed to having to rely on going into it. It is affecting them, but the clerk's office has stepped up and already under staff is answering every phone call. So it is going to be a slowdown, but once upon a time, we all had to keep paper books and we all had to listen when the judge said when our next court date was and actually remember it ourselves. So I think this is a temporary problem that we're all going to be able to get through. Thanks to the hardworking staff of the clerk's office. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, I do want to say that there is light at the end of the tunnel. It does look like, um, They've been working on the issues and hopefully they will be resolved by that. Well, this is Thursday, so by Monday, 
Um, and again, if anybody needs to come in, they can come in and, and view records. Um, the, and, and as Ms. Mosser pointed out, the phone calls that we generally get for our civil cases, which is our civil team, which is down. We have, a, we have several employees um, that will be going on leave. We also hear that that team is, is down about four um, staff clerks as it is. So they're, they're just pushing daily, answering the phone, answering the phone. So I, I would encourage folks to come in and view the records to be a lot easier than um, trying to make the phone call in case the lines are busy. Thank you, Ms. Barrow. Mr. Brown? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Ms. Massa, you mentioned they a couple of times. So for just clarity, could you, who actually has control of, the, of this public portal? So that is the clerk's office with IT. So they are working together to make sure that everything is as secure as possible. Uh, Circa Clerk Barrero has the responsibility to make sure all of our records are protected and she does that very carefully. And that's all that they're doing is making sure that whatever's happened throughout the entire country isn't happening here in Kane County. Okay, but I guess to broaden it out a little bit further, if this is a nationwide problem and they are working to correct this, who's... Each clerk's office, anybody who has a similar portal to what we have. And I have to say, this is probably not limited to court records. This is what happens when you have companies that do stuff like this. Again, what we're doing is we've seen that there's an issue somewhere else and we're just making sure it doesn't happen here. Okay, thank you. And just keep us updated with the situation. Of course. Um, and then your resolution, we're gonna hold off as well. Yes. We're gonna defer that to another yes. um, meeting. Okay, so we will move on to our coroner's report for now. Hello, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Yes, um, reports on file. Um, and as far as the um, Safety Act presentation, we've uh, discussed, and there's really nothing um, that affects you know my office uh, with that presentation. But I just want to um, stand side to side with all the justice partners in the sense that what they do does affect me. And um, so I, I am in full support of whatever needs to happen uh, to come into compliance with uh, these uh, new um, rules and whatnot. Um, it's, it is a travesty that the state, you know, makes mandates and then expects, um, you know, others to pay for it. But you know what, it's, it's what we have to deal with and it's what we'll do. And um, I'm in full support, have no resolutions, um, or anything. The only other thing I'd like to mention is, um, I guess last week, uh, or Tuesday at the board meeting, there was some confusion, one board member, and I'm just, I'm very thankful for the board members that we have. It's just, uh, but I guess there was one that had a question as far as my budget adjustment for last year. Um, I, I really do wish that, you know, if, if he had questions, he should call. Uh, come over uh, instead of waiting for the last minute to raise these types of questions because these are, the resolution was vetted through um, the committees and there was op optimal time for questions and everything. Um, it's just it's kind of disingenuous when it happens at the last minute and I'm, my office is completely open and ready and willing to explain anything and, and everything. Um, so I would just ask that uh, you know anybody that has any questions about anything, feel free to contact me my chief, uh, come over to the building, you know, talk to me, um, more than happy to answer any questions like that. So that's all I have, unless anybody has any questions. Thank you, Coroner Russell. Any questions for a coroner? Um, just one question. I know last month you mentioned that there's going to be an, uh, a roundtable discussion next month, and I failed to write down the date regarding the opioid um, abuse. Yes, I believe that that is May 4th. May 4th, okay. Um, and I, I have yet to get an agenda for that. So once I do, I will send it out. Okay. Davis, question for Rob. Mr. Davis, go ahead. Right. Thank you. Uh, Rob, do we still have, you know, at least on the radar, you know, uh, discussions about a lab? Is that, what's the status? Yeah. There? Yes, we do. Uh, I have a feasibility oh, study going on right now. And, All right. You, know, you don't have to have give to us the whole thing right now. I just wanted to kind of make sure that that's still out there in the world. And I, and yes, I will call is. you directly and you can tell me more. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, no, no problem. You can ask questions like that. I'm just, the, the question that was asked on Tuesday was 
Um, right. It was right. kind of just disheartening. You know, it was, it's like, you know, we lay everything out and then the last minute it was like, come on, you know, let's, let's discuss this beforehand. Uh, there's explanations for everything. So. Well, here, here's one more question then maybe for the, for the room and um, out of that discussion the other day that you're referencing, it, it, a lot of it's about autopsies, right? That's, I mean, that's, yep. that's really the where. So is there, let's have some discussion about some, a, a funding mechanism of some kind that includes all of the people that actually use that service, because th there's nowhere else that any, my understanding is that none of the fire districts, municipalities, any other governmental agency go anywhere other than to you if they've got a body. That's so, correct. So, and maybe chief judge can help me here. Is there, you know, maybe there's some way that, you know, that it can be structured more like a user fee or some, some kind of participation where the pain can be spread out. So it's not a terrible burden to any one group, but um, help with the, well, the budget problem that you guys what have, I, that you have. What I can say is, uh, you know, the issue in the past that we've had, the reason that that looked like such a big adjustment was the fact that it is a culmination of many years of um, a political battle, we'll say. Um, one person saying that you don't need to do this and then the law saying I need to do, I absolutely need to do it. And it wound up being a political situation. And I'm just very happy that the board saw it the way that it, it was and uh, remedied it and gave me the, so this year I actually have a budget that I can work with and I fully expect um, barring any other, you know, pandemic or whatever we might have um, to stay, you know, within that because it is a reasonable budget. The past budgets that I, I had been given were not reasonable. Um, and that's the reason that we had to come back um, because it is the responsibility per state law for the county to pay for my autopsies. And, you know, I try to do the best I can and make sure that only necessary autopsies occur. And um, I, I think, you know, it's one thing for me to say it, but when the International Association of Coroners and Medical Examiners and the states and the state uh, part, um, state association, everything, have looked at my stuff and said, you know, you're right on. So don't listen to me, listen to them. And, um, you know, I thought we were over with that battle. Um, but, you know, if we need to, uh, you, you know, look at it again, I, I'm prepared and ready to do that. Uh, I know we do what we do. Um, and what we're doing is right. And um, we don't want to have to come back and, and fix, um, you know, things that were like I've had to do in the past and fix other uh, death rulings. And we want to do it right the first time. So many of the different agencies and departments, you know, rely on my information uh, from the state's attorney to the sheriff to all of the different police agencies, um, you know, in the um, public defender. And many of them all rely on the, on the information that comes from this office. And it has to be right. And or, no, you know, Rob, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on this. I didn't mean to, to prompt a, no, no, okay. a, a defensive position for you. My, my interest here was really more um, a perspective of financial approach as opposed to political. And, you yeah. know, insurance agencies, who I find evil quite often, um, love to subrogate <laughs> things, right? Share the load. So I'm just, I'm just trying to find a way that as stewards of taxpayer dollars, you have to do what you do, but maybe we can find a, a better way of, you know, funding that expense. That's a, that was, that was sure. my point. And that, I'm no, open that to no any lab. and all suggestions. <laughs> open to any and all suggestions. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay. Um, any other questions for our coroner? Okay, we will move on to the agenda. Um, under new business, I had discussion of the county code. Um, if with everybody's indulgence, we'll defer that for the another, next 30 days. If anybody has anything they wanted to um, change, um, I know Mr. Shepro and uh, has been working on this. So we'll, um, if you can send any suggestions to Mr. Shepro and I, we can put that on the meeting for next agenda. Um, okay, and then we will move on. We're gonna, like I said, we changed this agenda a little bit. So we're gonna start with our presentations. I'm gonna hand it over to um, State's Attorney Master. She'll kind of direct uh, this portion of the meeting. So good morning. Um, what will follow is a presentation by the Judicial and Public Safety Partners regarding our current <laughs> financial needs, along with any needs that are arising because of different statutory unfunded mandates, such as the Safety Act. 
What has been happening is the state's attorney's office presented on different funding mechanisms, given what we are all experiencing in King County, is that most of our divisions are unfortunately underfunded. So in an effort to be proactive about this and to find different ways as opposed to just saying we all need money, we made a presentation to the county board about different possibilities. Right now, the county board is looking at the retailer's occupation tax. This is a tax that could fund four different areas within King County. One of them obviously is public safety, which is why we're all presenting to you. The other three are mental health, transportation, or basically buildings and infrastructure. Yesterday at a special cow meeting, the other three divisions presented, and now this is our opportunity to present because what I wanted to be able to do was to present as a whole JPS, as opposed to just either myself or the sheriff or one person trying to explain the needs of each individual division. So with that being said, I believe our sheriff has compiled all of our presentations together and we will just go one after another to discuss the particular needs. Good morning. I will start with Kingham. Just a brief overview of our 2021 annual report. And as Ms. Mosser said, I'm talking about moving into 2022, some legislation and needs from um, for Kingham. So Kingham 911 continues to serve as a vital link between the citizens of King County and the public safety agencies devoted to protecting them. We dispatch for seven fire agencies and eight police agencies, as well as other agencies within the county. Our organization structure at this time has not changed. We are staffed by 15 telecom, or we're budgeted for um, 15 telecommunicators and three supervisor positions. And we have our three shifts. We're staffed 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Our staffing levels per shift currently, um, three to four telecommunicators per shift. They are assigned to call taker, fire dispatcher, county police dispatcher, municipalities dispatcher. And when we have our fourth additional, we have our call taker, fire dispatcher. Um, this is important because as you can see the list below, those are all the radio channels that they are responsible for monitoring during their shift. All of our personnel are cross-trained, meaning that they move position each of their shifts. And let me see if this pointer works. This screen right here is their touchscreen radio system. All of those squares up there are the channels they're responsible for monitoring. The blue are typically police, the red are fire, and then um, the other channels up there are all interoperability talk groups and channels for not only King County, but our neighboring and outside county agencies too. These are some of our other responsibilities. I'm not gonna go through them all, but these are just some of the things we don't usually talk about. Um, you know, we rebroadcast missing endangered. We rebroadcast um, be on the lookout for both criminals, victims, and alerts. We rebroadcast re weather alerts. Um, we enter missing persons. We enter wanted people. We enter stolen vehicles. And we do have some crossover with the sheriff's office for electronic home monitoring and notifications for those individuals. Our team also notifies after hours notifications for animal control, the health department and inclement weather for townships, KDOT, highway departments, um, and when we have a storm and, and there's significant damage after hours and things need to be moved. This is just a quick glimpse, our communication center, an example of one of the stations that our team sits at. Those are all one person's computer screens. Uh, we have three different mice, two different keyboards. Um, you can see this right here is for our 911 phone system. And those cards that are right there, those are emergency medical dispatch protocols. Those contain everything from a caller having chest pain to instructing CPR on an adult, a child, an infant, um, that radio screen that's on the side there, that's touch screen. So this is what a telecommunicator operates with, you know, sometimes eight to 12, um, at worst case scenario, 16 hours a day. Those councils do raise and lower for the comfort of our team because we're always trying to keep in mind what's the best working conditions. Just an overview of our, our activity in 20 and 21. We did see a decrease in phone calls in 21, which may seem odd. However, in 2020, we had a significant increase in phone calls of 2020, mostly really related to the pandemic. Prior to the health department um, getting another answering service, Canecom was the answering service for the health department after hours. So we took phone calls from anything related to 
can I go shopping at the store to asking for information about vaccines? Um, those came in on 911 calls. Those came in on non-emergency calls. So I do not see this decrease of activity. Um, it, it's, it's normal. Like now we're trending more where we need to be after the pandemic and after the health department has had a differing answering service. 90% of our activity is from our police agencies, the largest being the sheriff's office, and 10% of our activity comes from our fire agencies. Just a quick overview of our five-year trends, obviously a decrease from 19 into 20, again, best explained by the pandemic, and the decrease in officer-initiated activity. But as you can see from the reports that I included for February in the packet, we are on the increase again. We are seeing an increase um, in calls for service each month. One of the large projects that we did in 21 was the upgrade to our um, Starcom Motorola system. We implemented that in um, pretty much all of last year. Our radio councils went live in March. And then after significant testing with those, then our police agencies went live on the system June 1st. Our fire agencies are on our VHF system. However, they receive Starcom radios for interoperability between all of our neighboring agencies. And we all continue to work together. Tricom, Quadcom, Elgin, Aurora, all of our neighboring centers on interoperability talk groups and planning ahead for long for large scale incidents. This is helpful being on the same platform that we have these plans in place and we're ready to go in the event something happens. Our communication center. So. Prior, you can see that picture above. Uh, we had six workstations, two pods. That furniture was from 2006. Now we have eight matching stations, more space, social distancing, yet more inclusive communication for the room. However, we do still have some space challenges. There are only two offices in KingCom, my office, the deputy director's office. Our radio administrator's office is in the yellow house under the stairs. <laughs> yeah. He's in the yellow house, he's all right. <laughs> Our meeting space is limited and we reserve meeting space in other buildings. Um, meeting space in terms of subscriber meetings, testing for new telecommunicators, interviewing. Um, we have to find other space in other buildings to do that. And our telecommunicators don't have any private space for breaks. They actually use this space up here by the lockers. We do have a kitchen, but sitting in the kitchen, it's open to everybody. So when people are walking through, when they're having conversations, it's not really a quiet space for them on a break for them to decompress. So we continue to look for options for additional office space in our new positions, primarily um, we do have a new position starting in a couple of weeks, our operations manager position. So we are trying to problem solve that right now. Another measure of our activity that we don't often talk about but impacts all of our public safety um, partners is our audio requests. Um, we receive about 509 subpoenas in 2021, 107 subscriber requests. And when we pull audio from that incident, we're reviewing it again. So if you have a fire incident that takes about four hours, when we're pulling that fire incident, we're again reviewing four hours of that activity. That takes a lot of staff time. And at this time, it's only Deputy Director Stofa and I doing that. So I mean, there's about 10 to 20% of our week. Um, again, this would impact the state's attorney's office. This impacts the sheriff's office as part of their investigation and as well as the court system. And with the implementation of next gen 911, there will be additional costs. There will be additional staff hours because now we'll be receiving pictures, video, and text. That's going to take a lot of time to review. So we have talked about next generation 911 in the past. Um, previously, there was a goal by the state to be in place by 2020. Um, however, now we're moved to this year. So the first, I believe 30 in the state are anticipated to go live on next generation 911 in June. We anticipate KingCom um, to maybe be in that second 30 in September. So we are preparing for that. As preparation, we have received some grants, we've done upgrades, we are ready and we continue to pursue additional technology. This year we had our VPN and our site survey done um, so we can assess our equipment. And we did implement Z access technology, which means when cellular companies provide it to us, we will know the caller's X coordinate, Y coordinate, so we'll have the latitude, longitude, and now the Z coordinate will provide the vertical location. So if someone's on the second story of a building or if they're um, you know, in a different, other than ground level, the Z access technology will provide that to us. 
What we haven't talked about much is the effects of next generation 911 on our team, because this will introduce a variety of new challenges. Uh, the callers will have the ability to send pictures and video, and it will require us to have additional virtual storage capabilities. But now in addition to hearing traumatic phone calls and emotional callers, our telecommunicators could potentially be exposed to visual, visual details of this incident in a live environment which will require additional training and support. We don't know, will, will we just be able to see callers? Will at some point callers be able to see us? I mean, for many that are in this field, we chose this part of public safety because we don't necessarily want to see it. Um, so that's just something new that we continue to research in KCOM is how to provide you know, peer support. What does the additional training look like? What is the support that's needed for our team? Because currently, um, you know, there are studies out there talking about how vulnerable telecommunicators are to PTSD just as much as fire police and EMS. When evaluated, about 18 to 24% of telecommuters currently experience PTSD, but we anticipate this, per this percentage will dramatically increase with the ability to not only hear and um, the incident, but also see it, which is why we think that this quiet room or this private space to decompress after a stressful call is so important. So we're working with building maintenance, maintenance and possible solutions for that. It's just not an aspect of next gen 911 we've really talked about yet. Um, so some additional legislation, 911-988. Uh, 988 is going to be the new national suicide hotline. We are waiting for more information on this. Uh, what is the crossover between 911 and 988 and crisis hotlines? Um, our organizations, APCO and NINA, are closely following this legislation. We are waiting for more information about a statewide committee. Once a statewide committee is established, we can establish our local committees. Then we'll know what our specific requirements are, our direction from the state committee, what the crossover is going to be, what our policies are going to be, what's 911 role, what's the 988 role. Um, so we're just waiting for all that. Currently, the deadline is July of 22, but again, we're monitoring that. We don't know if the legislation will change because that's, that's really quickly to move with still needing these committees to be established. Another piece of legislation is House Bill 4240. Um, this is going to require that our telecommunicators receive emergency mental health dispatch training and training for interviewing 911 calls without unintentionally leading 911 callers to distort actual emergency situations. This again will have a cost. We don't know, will the training be eight hours? Will the training be a week? Will the training be two, we're unsure. So our goals and objectives, you know, all listed there. We've done a lot in 21. We're going to be doing a lot again in 22. We are revising all of our policies, procedures, our quality assurance program. We're working on updating all of our agreements. Our subscriber agreement ends on November 30th. So we'll be working in collaboration with everybody to renew that. With so many unknowns, it is difficult to predict for CaneCom. Um, additional staffing, additional cost, administrative services, building needs. We do know there will be additional costs. We're just unsure of what that looks like for 911 at this time. Um, but as Ms. Gums highlighted, you know, I do want to end on uh, the importance of our team and um, you know, the job of a first first responder um, because they are the, the gold line, the golden glue that holds it all together. Um, and we're doing everything we can to provide them the best support during this time. And that's all I have this morning. Thank you, Ms. Guthrie. Um, if, if it's okay, we'll hold um, any questions to the end. We'll just keep continue on with our presentations. Sure, Fane, I'm gonna go ahead and cover uh, very briefly uh, our budget impact. So I have the luxury of being in office for three and a half years now. And I think everybody's pretty aware of my progressive attitude towards law enforcement and uh, our outstanding command staff and team that we have at the sheriff's office. And of course the incredible county board. So, you know, under the last three and a half years, we've been able to position ourselves even before uh, the safety act was a conversation to line ourselves up with equipment policy and training that already accommodates all of the needs uh, within our own existing budget. And I'm just going to cover those real quick. The main hits, uh, as everybody knows, we have body cameras now. That's a fully functional system every single police officer does uh, at the sheriff's office. Uh, we established our tactical training unit uh, three years ago, and they are now covering every gamut of mandated training within the Safety Act. 
the, the psychological care mandate that requires a peace officer to see uh, psychiatric care once per year is uh, currently being covered by the Diagnostic Center. I've worked that out with Dr. Sain. Um, we also have, for the last three years, four different levels of rungs of support for all of our sworn personnel and office that they can follow should they need it. And people do take advantage of that. Uh, the arrestee phone call requirement where they're uh, required to be allowed a, a certain number of phone calls within a certain period of time after arrest, we've established a uh, policy on both uh, the corrections and police side to accommodate that uh, before that, uh, when the safety act was just a conversation, we just want to be compliant with it. Complaint tracking, uh, complaints against police officers, we have our office of professional standards that will maintain uh, that status quo as they always have. And there's uh, new mandates regarding pregnant females in custody and our corrections team, Commander Asmani's here, um, is working on uh, designing that policy. So we'll be well prepared to, to take care of that. And of course, like Michelle said, and I think everybody else as they go through this is gonna say all of the unknowns. So uh, we're planning to have some sort of post-arrest hearing support. So uh, from the sheriff's office side with our diversion team, we're really concerned about the people who need our help in custody the most that are getting it now, uh, not being held anymore because they're nonviolent drug crimes. So they're gonna go right back out and uh, continue to recidivize, continue to uh, be exposed uh, to addiction without treatment. And unfortunately, overdose is our number one worst concern. So we want to have a team in place at that post-arrest hearing to kind of uh, put our, our grips on them and see if we can divert them into some sort of support if they're willing to accept it. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen to our jail population. We don't know if judges are going to remand more people uh, to err on the side of safety or if uh, judges are going to feel that they just don't have uh, the proper authority to, to remand them. So is our jail population going to fall? Um, electronic monitoring, we're positioned to uh, hopefully see a rise in, in that as, as a, uh, a peace of mind for a lot of our judges to, to place people on electronic monitoring. Our team is established and in place and, and can handle uh, at least double the workload that they have now. Um, and again, this goes with that post arrest hearing support. We're worried about public safety in general with those not receiving that current custodial support that they get right now, whether it be mental health or the lack of opportunity or, or the addiction. We don't know where this is going to take us out on the streets of Kane County and the Illinois Law Enforcement Training and Standards Board. So they gave us all these training mandates, but unfortunately, there is no clear certification of those mandates. There, there is no clear uh, way to communicate to them. There was supposed to be a portal that was established where we could submit this information for each and every officer. But. Nothing's been done with that yet. Also with officer complaints, as you guys are aware, uh, there is a potential for I let's be to decertify a police officer based on an act, but there's no real clear guidance on how they may or may not do that and how we're supposed to communicate complaints to them like the law mandates. So lots of question marks. And that concludes my portion. And I think we're at Ms. Mosser. So thank you. My presentation is going to appear long, but it is going to go quickly. If I go to the right presentation. So again, I've already explained the purpose for this is that at this point, we are all advocating that the decision for the county board be to focus on public safety. For the state's attorney's office, we um, are here by statute. There is no choice in having the state's attorney's office because it is a law that we have to follow. And I would really like to focus on three of our divisions when I'm talking about this. First of all, you all know the civil division and you've seen how hard they've worked. And there's so much that the civil division does that people don't even really understand. Right now, we have nine attorneys in total. We were actually able to hire an attorney solely to deal with the issues related to the influx of COVID-related matters. Um, but on top of that, we provide advice to all of our county departments, our county officials, and that includes the FOIA responses that we not only get for this office, but for every other office, because we're here to provide legal advice. In our criminal division, we prosecute everything that occurs in Kane County from traffic up to homicide. Now there are matters that are prosecuted by local prosecutors, but those are traffic offenses, DUIs, smaller misdemeanors. 
There are cases that would fall under the jurisdiction of the attorney general or the U.S. attorney's office, depending on what they are. They may occur in King County, but they fall under their jurisdiction, but everything else is handled by my office. We, um, this year, this past year, really focused on specializing the courtrooms and or with the prosecutors. And the reason why we did this is uh, threefold. The first is that it is going to make it so that we have attorneys who really know what they're doing about the cases. When you have a specialty and you understand what's going on, you're going to be able to do better for the prosecution. The second way is that this is going to provide consistency. Consistency is essential in offers because I do not want one person to have an offer that is different from another person when it's very similar in fact and criminal history. That is the right way to do this. And the third thing, frankly, is I believe this is going to move cases quicker throughout our system. And this is what we need to do because I do believe that we spend too much time going status date to status date to status date. Now you're a year, two years, three years down in the case. And so these are the divisions that we have. Our major crimes does exactly that. Anything that has to do with homicides, armed violence, our bigger cases that you want the best of the best on. And the people with the most experience, I have four attorneys in that division. Guns and gangs are going to deal with anything that deals with our gang situation, as well as people who are possessing guns. Uh, there are three people in that. Our Child Advocacy Center deals with all of the sex abuse cases that happen to children who are 13 and under, and that has four attorneys. Our property financial crimes against law enforcement, which we call the anchors in our courtroom. There are four different individuals for that division. Domestic violence, DUI felony and traffic, that is obvious. Um, our special victims unit that is going to deal with any type of sex offense to adults as well as violent crimes to adults or even to the elderly because we want to make sure that we're treating um, victims, especially when they have certain needs in a different manner than we would potentially with general cases. Uh, we created our felony review unit, which is very much uh, making our police officers happy because now we have three people who are doing these uh, felony review as opposed to a variety of individuals. We have our post-conviction unit, which handles um, any time a person comes in and files a post-conviction oh. petition. Um, and newly created as of last week is our conviction integrity unit. This is one of the things that we tried to actually obtain funding for the board, but the board was unable to do so. So when we restructured everything, we were able to move an attorney out of one division and create this particular unit. And for the best practices of a county, having a conviction integrity unit is exactly the thing that we need to have. Um, I'm going to go through our statistics. I think next month we're going to talk about our end of year report. As you can see, we're at 14 homicides in King County. That is 14 homicides too much. We are, what's important to note is that eight of those are ones that we charge. These are significant cases with a lot of discovery, a lot of evidence, a lot of things that we have to look at. And what you should know is that we have, are still prosecuting cases that have occurred in 2020, 2019, and 2018, because when the pandemic hit, those are the cases that kind of got pushed back. Thanks to the leadership of our chief judge, as well as with our public defender, those are the cases that we're re we've been able to take to trial. And in 2021, we had an unprecedented amount of these big trials go so that these people who have been in our jail for a significant amount of time are now on their way to the Department of Corrections. For narcotics cases, we're trending a little bit up from last year, just only two cases. I do envision these cases will start to trend down because of deflection programs such as the pre-arrest diversion, and I'm going to discuss that a little further. Um, our gun cases are trending up. Now, these gun cases vary from just a simple possession when somebody doesn't have a conceal and carry license but does have a FOID, all the way up to people who are using the weapons because it's a part of a gang or because they are um, committing a homicide. Our felony DUI cases are about even to what they were before. Again, this is something that I find uh, very concerning because as people were stuck in their house, um, that's what was happening. With the presence of Uber and Lyft and other areas like that, we really shouldn't have these, but these are the multiple offenders when you get to a felony DUI or they've hurt or killed somebody. 
What's important to note is that we are working on trying to create a uh, DUI rehabilitative court. And again, that's going to be later in my presentation because the idea with these cases is that we need to be a lot more intensive about helping these individuals break the cycle of addiction. Our misdemeanor DUI cases skyrocketed. And this is, should be also be very concerning because these are just our misdemeanor DUI cases. This is not the local DUI cases. They're still prosecuting those matters. So misdemeanor DUI cases just essentially means that this is their first time, possibly it could be a second time and it wasn't charged as a felony offense, but that is an alarming number. Another alarming part of that is a lot of these police departments have body cameras and that is a significant amount of evidence that we're viewing on these cases that are just increasing and increasing. Our Child Advocacy Center, while we charged only 65 cases, which is a decrease from what we had last year, we did 401 investigations. That was almost 100 investigations over what we did last year, and that is a lot of work. This takes a case manager, this takes a special investigator, and somebody who's there to talk to the child in the appropriate way. It is difficult to charge child advocacy cases because the evidence usually is from a child. And these children come in and they are always very believable, but we have to make sure that when we're trying this, we're not just charging a case because of one statement, we're charging it and we're looking at the other evidence that we may have. These are very time intensive investigations and ones that really take a lot out of my advocates and the investigators and the attorneys who handle those matters. Felony domestic violence is up. I want you to know that felony domestic violence is up because of strangulation cases. Strangulation cases take moments to become homicides. And this is something that we're taking very seriously at the state's attorney's office. I have a fantastic person who is in charge of the domestic violence unit who really focuses on these matters and is provided a lot of strangulation training so that we understand the severity of these matters. But again, terrifying because the pandemic put the abusers and forced them to be in the home still with the victims in these cases. Misdemeanor domestic violence cases are trending a little bit down. I think they're a little bit down because we've provided more training about the strangulation cases to law enforcement. So I actually think that the appropriate charge is the felony and that's why you're seeing less misdemeanor cases overall. Our abuse and neglect petitions are about what they were last year. Again, this is a trend that I believe the chief judge would agree with me. We're just going to continue to see these numbers. As you know, we um, added a, a very experienced attorney to our abuse and neglect division and the public defender's office did as well because we need to make sure that we're treating these cases appropriately. So why do I bring all those statistics up and why am I talking to you? Um, a lot of that has to do with the Safety Act. Now, as you all know, the Safety Act was signed into law. It is sweeping criminal justice reform and it affects every single one of us. So what are the statutory requirements that are really affecting my office? Um, those are the ones that we're about to discuss. Just starting off with that, body cameras. All of the police departments in King County have to have cameras by 2025, depending on their population. In King County alone, we have 36 different police departments with approximately 1,374 office officers. Now this does not include departments that may come into us such as ATF um, or DEA that would then have their own requirements. Every single officer when they are on an eight hour shift will have body camera. If you have five police officers that show up to a domestic violence, even if they're only there for an hour, that is five hours of body camera that we're viewing. Um, I had an opportunity to um, have an email exchange with Roger Fonstock in regards to what this looks like. Um, the storage for the sheriff, the SAO and the PD, it's unknown at this point because we really don't know how many that we're going to have and what that looks like. If the sheriff has it on their database, does it mean it's just copied on mine or do I have it in its additional um, storage? When the PD has that, does it mean it's different? So they're looking at that. Roger estimated that we really need to look at possibly between $500,000 for capital and $1,000 per year. And that's just unknown as to what the maintenance is or additional storage that's going to happen. Um, we need to fix our discovery programs in Kane County because the way that we have it now is just not functional. There are four different ones that we are looking into. We are looking into TechShare, which they have in DuPage County. Box, evidence.com, and what Odyssey has to present. 
Um, I've had conversations with Odyssey and it would take at least a couple of years and thousands, thousands of dollars in order for them to give us the discovery system because we have giant amounts of discovery that we have to tender to defense counsel. And right now we waste a significant amount of time because it gets sent from the police department. We download it one place, then we have to download it another place, then we have to send it. Then assuming the defense attorney gets the link for everything, then it goes um, to them. We have many defense attorneys who don't download it from there and then we're doing it all over again. So we need to actually be on the forefront of this so that we can put discovery in one place, we check a box and then the defense attorney has access to it. Um, at a minimum, I believe this is going to be 100 to $300,000. But if we don't do this now, we are behind the eight ball and everything for discovery. In addition to that, we need conversion programs and editing programs. Last year, we purchased a conversion program for $25,000. It's for 25 users. Now we'll only have to renew it for $14,500. And essentially what it means is if the sheriff sends me um, body cam and Aurora sends me body cam, I can take those and convert them into one way that's easy for all of us to use. And then it also has an editing system so that when we go to trial, if we have to take a portion of it out, that's what that program does. But I'm not the only one who would need to have that here. We would need to have that probably for the Sheriff's Department and for the Public Defender's Office as well. Um, so this means it's going to take a lot longer for us to review cases. Uh, a Benton County, Oregon prosecutor explained that now, instead of it being four pages, it's almost like 60 pages of a police report. A Virginia study has shown that for every um, body cam for every 75 body worn employed cameras now we have to have an additional prosecutor and so that's where i'm going to get my numbers from because now instead of just looking at a police report ethically i and every prosecutor in my office has to look at this body camera footage we have to do it for the entirety of it even if it seems like it's just them talking at some point point. And when one officer is here and another officer is here, I have to watch this one and the other officer because that's ethically what we have to do. So, and I want you to know that these numbers are going to be staggering. And I feel like I do this every time I speak to all of you. So here's your warning. This is the worst case scenario right now that I'm planning for because I am doing the math and I'm looking at how many officers that we have. And this is what I would imagine that we would have to have as all of this body cam footage comes in. Now, does this mean it has to be for next year? Absolutely not, because not every police department has to have their body cams by next year. But this is what I'm looking at down the road. And this is why I'm asking that the county board to kind of look at what we're doing. In addition to the ASAs, I need more support staff. Our support staff now are drowning in their work. My poor evidence clerk is the only one that I have. So we are actually losing a person because she's retiring and I'm changing her job into an evidence job so that I can have somebody to back up my evidence clerk. We are going to need another FOIA attorney because all of this stuff that we have is going to be FOIA by somebody. And we need somebody who's going to be able to look at all of that body cam footage along with the FOIA support staff. Um, another requirement is deflection programs. I'm thrilled about this. I love this uh, part of the Safety Act because deflection programs are getting people out of the criminal justice system. If they're out of the criminal justice system, I don't have to prosecute them. We are then focusing on prosecuting the people that we want and need to prosecute and the people who are damaging to our community. So my thought process for the state's attorney's office is threefold. The first one is I would like to expand our current diversion programs. We have diversion programs that deal with first time felony offenses, with drug offenses, um, with the emerging adult populations. But as we expand those to make sure that those low level nonviolent offenders get the benefit of this program, I need people who are going to be supervising them, who are going to be deferring them into the programs that they need. And so that's why we're asking for additional case managers and support staff. In addition to that, as I alluded to earlier, we really need to have a DUI rehabilitative court here. Now, this is very similar to drug rehabilitative court, treatment alternative court, and veterans court, where it says, here's a person who has an alcohol or drug issue, but they're also getting behind the wheel of a car. And that's dangerous for every single one of us. But what we need to do is something more intense than what we've already done, because this is their second or third or fourth or fifth DUI. So what can we do to make this better? 
The DUI Rehabilitative Court is one that is many other jurisdictions, and we've been modeling ours of, of McHenry County. It actually has a higher success rate than their drug rehabilitative court, because most of the time the DUI, the alcohol offenders, are functioning, they're just alcoholics. But we need to get them so that they're not causing the damage to our community that they are. And to have that, I would need to have another ASA and I would need to have a support staff to assist with that. Um, we are also working with our uh, court services department. I know that they are looking for their drug rehabilitative court to see if there's different tiers that can happen within that so that we're making sure to give the help that we need to everybody. I do wanna point out that every single time I ask to add a prosecutor or I get a prosecutor added, that should have an equivalent effect on Ms. Conant because her, she would need the staff just as much as I would need that person. Um, in addition to that, I think you know that we've created pre-arrest diversion. And through the hard work of Martha Paschke, this is entirely grant funded, along with the um, Sheriff Hain having given us the money first to hire Ms. Paschke. So right now, this is what we would need to have a fully funded pre-arrest diversion program. What I've put behind it is anything that says GF is funded right now by our grant. The rest of the stuff would need to be either funded from the county so that we could get throughout the entire county, or we would need more grants. Um, the sheriff and I have decided that we are going to work together and I had hired a grant uh, writer. That grant writer's here for all of judicial partners. So I know that the sheriff is using her, her as well. This is a person who I think can bring in more money to fund these programs. And remember, every single time that we deflect somebody through pre-arrest diversion and they don't come into court, it means they're not being arrested by the local agency. They're not being brought to the sheriff's department. They're not going to bond call. They're not having to have the services of the public defender. They're not coming into court for status date after status date after status date until they get to the end result, which is treatment. Instead, they're going right to the services that they need. Ultimately, we are saving money for the county. We are diverting our resources to where they really need to go by being creative about what we're doing in helping the criminal justice system. Um, in addition to that, as the sheriff alluded, there's training for law enforcement that includes my SAO investigators. And frankly, it includes the fact that we, as the state's attorney's office, need to help provide this training. And we're trying to do that by developing programs. And again, the best practices is we really should have a training department. The conviction integrity attorney that I hired is also going to be the portion of our training department right now. But the best practice is to have people who are actually doing that. So we are giving the best legal advice to our sheriff, to our court security, um, and throughout our police department so that when we are prosecuting cases, it's because it's done on good investigations. Um, this is very important to note. I have zero space in the state's attorney's office anymore. Every time I go to somebody's office, such as Teresa Barrero's, I always look at the space to see what we could potentially take. Uh, it is true. But if we have to hire all of these people, we need a place to put them. So we need to keep that in mind. And I don't know what the cost is. Associated with every single person, we're also going to need computers, laptops, cell phones, technology. That's an unknown cost at this time, but it's a reality. Um, the last part of this is ending cash bail. Again, I think Sheriff Hain and I have been very um, effusive in our support of this because a poor murderer stays in jail as much as a rich murderer because that's a danger to our community. But what we're doing is we're holding people who are not a danger to com the community. <laughs> but as I'm sure Circa Guerrero will talk about, this is how we've funded our system. We've funded the system on the backs of the defendants this entire time because that's how it's been set up and that's going to be eliminated. For our purposes, now we have pretrial release hearings. These pretrial release hearings have been mandated to be in person. Um, and right now there's another trailer bill, which I'm hoping does not go very far, that requires that we have to do a preliminary hearing before we even ask to hold them. For those of you who may not know, the preliminary hearing is the where we usually bring them to the grand jury. If we don't have a grand jury on an everyday basis like Cook County does, then we're going to be having hearings where we're calling police officers in to testify. These are going to be full-blown contested hearings that we just don't have the time or availability for. Um, in addition to this, there's discovery requirements that we have to comply with, and we have to have written petitions when we want to hold somebody. 
And there is now a criminal penalty if there's something that we put in there that's false. Now, I do not believe in one second that any of my attorneys would put in something false, but if they are moving very quickly, they may make a mistake. So I need experienced attorneys to put in this so that we limit any of those issues. In addition to that, now there's a requirement that, or there will be a requirement that we can't just issue a warrant when somebody fails to appear. We have to file what's called a rule to show cause. That rule to show cause has to be brought before the judge. The judge has to issue it, and then it has to be served on the individual. And that would mean that the sheriff's department is now going out serving all these individuals. If that individual is served and then fails to appear for court, then we get a warrant for them. So again, we need experienced attorneys who are going to be able to do this. We need uh, service personnel who's going to do this. And this is going to slow down a lot of cases. Because again, if you're not served with it, we can't go forward with the case. And to me, that's a travesty for our victims who then are waiting and waiting and waiting for justice to happen. Um, in addition to that, and really unrelated to the Safety Act, we do not have anything right now that's really focusing on the severe child physical abuse cases. These are ones that you've always known as shaken baby cases. This is something that we should have in King County because we have more of these than anybody would think. And because we have different departments, sometimes DCFS is called and the police are not called. And if the police are not called, then investigators not put on it. And so we need to have a way in King County, much like our major crimes task force, that when this is coming out, people are called out to the scene. This is something that could be housed actually in our child advocacy center, but we would need additional staff to be able to do this. Now, these are cases that are very serious because the first time we know about it is when the baby's taken to the emergency room. That's when those doctors realize that there's something more and they transport the kids out to a place like Lurie's Hospital where there's a specialty. And it's until then when investigators are called in that we really know that something's going on. But there's precious time that we have to figure out who is the one that abused the child, which unfortunately typically is one of the parents or somebody who's even watching the child. But that is time that's wasted unless we have a department that's actually able to do this investigation and the prosecution and the proper interviews. In addition to that, we must have a cyber crimes unit. Now, cyber crimes really is dealing with the child pornography cases. And I really wanna talk about this statistic. In 2021, the child protectus, um, the CPS recorded that 39 people were actively downloading and sharing child pornography here in Kane County. Now, when I say actively, I mean on a daily basis over and over again. This isn't the people who maybe do it on one day and then another day. There's plenty of those here. And I have to tell you, when we run those numbers, St. Charles, Geneva, Batavia, they're coming up with really high numbers of people who are downloading pornography. According to the Will County Cyber Crimes Unit, 90% of the people who, are hand, who actively download are also hands-on predators. That means there are children that they are affecting. So that translates to about 25 children in King County that may have been molested by these users in 2021. Now there are police departments who have people who are experts in this, but it's not throughout all of King County. We need to work and have a department here in King County that specializes that and our sheriff is on board with making sure that we have investigators as well as prosecutors and people who are specialists in the actual computer portion of this. Um, we met with one particular unit who said that for the first year of operation, it would cost $250,000 and for every year after it would cost $170,000. Now, what you will note in here is that there are no prosecutors that are listed because we were able to get that last year. Now we need the investigators so that we have the tools to investigate and prosecute these individuals. I guarantee you, if we have this division, you will see an increase in the child pornography cases that we charge because now we're looking at it. There is a program that is used by the Attorney General's office called ICAC that essentially downloads this peer-to-peer -peer because or groups like Google will actually share that information because they don't want them using their services. It goes to a program and we can look at it and we can actively see what they're downloading. But unless we have investigators who are doing it, there's nothing that we can go. We can go on. 
So, and again, just because I come up with big numbers, this is the potential. This is the worst case scenario of what we're looking at in terms of personnel that we need for the Safety Act and because there are divisions that we need. Technology, Roger Fonstock is much more able to discuss that, but there's a lot more that we need to do and this needs to be funded because again, this is by statute. Lastly, as I always do, I want you to know that the red number is the difference between the attorneys in my office and the attorneys in Lake County who are close to what we are. That is a huge difference in terms of experience and it's the reason why I lose people, it's the reason why Teresa loses people and Rochelle loses people. Um, these are senior staff positions. So even my staff is not being appropriately paid and why wouldn't they wanna go somewhere else where they can make a lot more money? Um, starting salary, I'm happy that it's not as bad for the first time ASA, but when you have a senior or principal ASA, when we're not able to adequately pay them as they go up through this, why wouldn't they go over to Lake County? Sa staff salary is the same thing. Again, we are significantly different and that's something every time we lose somebody, we have to train somebody else. Everybody else is overworked and then eventually I lose somebody all over again. So that is it for me. Yeah. Go ahead, Ms. Conant. Thank you. Good morning. I'm going to begin with this is our uh, budget outline for fiscal year 2022. Uh, important to note here, in which will be discussed throughout the presentation, is 77% of uh, the public defender's budget is salary and wages. Uh, we are mandated by statute to provide our services. We not only do that in the criminal courtrooms, but we also um, do are mandated to do that in the abuse and neglect courtroom, juvenile court, mental health court. We are appointed to sexually violent person petitions. These are petitions filed by the attorney general's office where they are trying to continue to hold and treat people who have been convicted of sexual offenses and are being released from the Department of Corrections. Additionally, we are mandated and appointed uh, to represent individuals in the Department of Corrections who have filed petitions known as post-conviction petitions to try to get their case back to the trial level. So we are not just providing services in the criminal arena, but all throughout the county, we are mandated to provide our services and our expertise. Our current needs and shortfalls come into four categories. Number one is salary and wages, additional attorneys and support staff, and then the importance of the 77% of our budget that goes to salary and wages is that because the rest of our budget is so, so much less, we are strapped in areas of space requirements and office equipment. And when we are mandated by statute to provide additional services, those are the areas that become stretched as well. This is an outline of where we're going to start with salaries and wages. This is a comparison of the Keene Assistant Public Defender's starting salary with that of Keene Judicial Staff Attorneys and Keene Assistant State's Attorneys. As you can see, there is a $5,000 difference between what a starting Assistant Public Defender comes in and at and what a Keene Assistant State's Attorney would be making. In the public defender's office currently, we have seven attorneys with one to four years of experience who are making less than the 59,000 that, that an assistant starting state's attorney would make. And, and when I talk about starting assistants, those are generally people who are right out of law school. So I have attorneys with four years of experience who are making less than what a brand new just licensed attorney and the state's attorney would be starting at. The starting salary in the public defenders in our office has not been raised since 2015. So while other departments have continued to raise their starting salaries, ours has been the same for seven years. This is a comparison as Ms. Mosser did to other um, counties and their salaries. And as you can see the difference, uh, this is the range an average range of bar admission, what someone would be making in Lake County, Will County, and in Kane County. And you can see the significant gap between those, uh, those other counties. And as Ms. Mosser pointed out, 
at the low level, when you're bringing in new attorneys, that range is, it, it is still different, but not exceedingly different. It's when you get to your most experienced attorneys that you start to see the bigger ranges. And that is important because we bring attorneys in, we train them, they, we teach them how to be good attorneys, and we want to keep them after we have done that. And that's difficult to do when we are competing with other counties that pay far more than what we are paying. Uh, last March, I gave you an example of uh, Lake County had uh, posted a position for $87,000. And this was, they were looking for someone with four years of experience that they were going to pay $87,000. In the public defender's office, I have 18 attorneys that make less than $87,000. Most of them with far more than four years of experience. Right now, um, within the last month, I have lost three attorneys. Two of those attorneys have gone to other, count, other public defender's offices in other counties, one to Kendall County and one to DeKalb County, both left for more money. I am currently looking to hire all of those positions. It has been difficult. I am not getting the resumes that we once used to get. And unfortunately, that is not just something that is unique to Kane County. In talking to other public defender's offices, they are all experiencing that lack of resumes. The problem is I'm not only faced with the problem of getting less resumes, but I am now competing with these other counties who are also trying to grab up these very few resumes that are out there. This is an example of the average King County salary. So uh, giving a range of bar admission dates, what an attorney would average in salary for an attorney in the Kane State's Attorney's Office versus an average salary in the Kane uh, Public Defender's Office. In past presentations, I've given you many, many examples of this. I will give one today. One of our most senior felony attorneys who handles our most serious cases, all of his cases are very serious. He handles murders, sex cases, uh, the most serious armed robberies. He has 26 years of experience. He is making $92,000 a year. A comparable assistant in the state's attorney's office who only has 20 years of experience, so six years less experience than him, doing the same work though, is making $99,000 a year. So that's just one example of the differences. Um, you can see that there's a $5,000 difference in starting salary, but that difference, as with the other counties, increases as you move up in experience in both offices. This relates to my resolution that has been put on hold for now, but uh, that I will be addressing later. This is the amount that I'm asking for in that resolution. What this resolution would do is get us compare, get the Kane County Assistant Public Defenders comparable to the Kane County Assistant State's Attorneys. And this is really just an issue of equity and fairness. These attorneys in both office, offices, they go to school for the same amount of time. They take the same bar exam to be licensed to practice law. Their duties as attorneys, while in different offices and uh, arguing different things, their duties are quite similar. The attorneys in the in public defender's office are not doing less work than the state's attorneys. They are doing the same amount of dirt work and often sometimes, while maybe not more work, but different kinds of work, when we are given a case, we have to investigate it from the ground level up. When the state's attorneys are given a case, they have the help of police officers who have investigated that case for them, who have worked it up for them, which is not to say that they don't do additional investigation and work on their own, but they have that head start where we are starting from the ground level in opening our case and investigating it and preparing it. Both offices work efficiently and effectively to get their jobs done. There is no reason that there should be a gap in their salaries. As I've said many times here before, for this system to work, for the whole system to work, we are only as good as each department is. 
if we are lacking, if the public defender's office is lacking, if I cannot retain attorneys because of this lapse in salary, it is going to be a problem for the whole criminal justice system. It is very difficult. I have had attorneys come in for, res for interviews and they have point blank asked, why is the state's attorney starting salary 59,000? I really don't have an answer to that for them. You know, they have chosen to do public defense work and it is unfair that I have to tell them because you have chosen this path, you are undervalued and making $5,000 less than your counterparts in the state's attorney's office. So while this resolution would bridge the gap between the assistant state's attorneys and public defenders in King County, it does not address the issue, the far reaching issue of our salaries between this county and other counties. The state's attorney's office, um, Ms. Mosser has talked to you about uh, her DUI and domestic violence courtroom um, in that unit that she is starting. With the, with the support of the chief judge, the, this is a very innovative program where they are going to be turning the second floor into three courtrooms that will solely focus on DUIs and domestic violence cases. Each courtroom will consist of felony and misdemeanor cases, and it is the purpose, is, as Ms. Mosser has told many times, is to focus on treatment and re rehabilitation, which is a fabulous thing for our clients and that we fully support. The problem is, is that this has added an additional misdemeanor courtroom. I currently, in the two courtrooms that we have now that do misdemeanor DUI and misdemeanor domestic, I have five misdemeanor assistants for those two courtrooms. At this point, with the start of this new unit and the second floor turning into three courtrooms, I will only have five misdemeanor assistants for now three courtrooms. The hope it was that potentially I would be able to bring an attorney from a different courtroom. A deep dive of the case numbers among all of the partners has indicated that the numbers are not going to change enough in those other courtrooms for me to be able to bring an attorney to help with the second floor initiative. And certainly while we support this initiative and we want it to work and to be successful, we will need an additional attorney to be able to move those cases effectively and efficiently. In regards to the Safety Act, there are two, two areas of the Safety Act that will impact our office, both of which you've heard about this morning, but that is body-worn cameras and the pretrial detention hearings. As to body-worn worn cameras, um, as Ms. Mosser has already pointed out, um, it, it, we are under a duty to review all discovery that is given to us. And so when we get these body-worn cameras, we are going to have to view them as attorneys. The attorneys are the ones who are going to have to view them. Um, we can receive anywhere from one to 10 or more uh, videos that contain these body-worn cameras per case, depending on the charges and the circumstances. These videos, as Ms. Mosser has indicated, can last for a couple of minutes or hours. Unfortunately, you can have some that last for hours and there may only be two minutes of action going on, but we have to watch that whole video to make sure that we are not missing anything. Additionally, oftentimes you will have to start, start and stop the videos so that you can go back and take notes or to go back and make sure you're hearing exactly what you thought you were hearing. That all takes time. Um, additionally, our support staff has to download all of these videos from multiple video players, uh, which takes an, an additional amount of time. This is just an example of what we are anticipating. Um, in domestic violence courtroom, uh, we opened an average of 50 cases a month for that courtroom with three attorneys per in that courtroom, that's about 166 cases a month. Um, average clients per these three attorneys is approximately 147. If you are, and for most domestic cases, most domestic misdemeanor cases, there are usually two officers that come to the scene. So you're talking about two body-worn cameras. So that is about 400 videos 
per attorney per year that they will have to be reviewing for that courtroom. Ms. Mosser pointed out that there is a Virginia study that came out in regards to body worn cameras and kind of gave a formula as to what you should be looking at in terms of how many attorneys would be needing would be needed for the addition of the body worn cameras. Based using that formula and um, also basing it on what Ms. Mosser was asking for, uh, we anticipate that that would be approximately 10 attorneys four support staff and two investigators. Um, of course, as Ms. Mosser indicated, this is probably worst case scenario at this time, uh, but it is based upon the formula from the study. Um, there are still a lot of unknowns with this, um, but this would be the, the price tag based upon that study. And then in regards to pretrial release, um, as Ms. Mosser has already indicated, these hearings are going to be much more in depth. Prior to um, COVID, when we were able to meet with our clients for bond call hearings, it was maybe five minutes which, with each client. You just needed to get enough information from them so that you could present an argument as to their life and um, in the hopes of giving information to set bond. It is gonna be much more in depth than that. This is almost like you are given your case and you have to start preparing that case. We are gonna have much more discovery. Um, as, as indicated, these um, the hearings have to be in person. So we are going to have the opportunity to sit down and talk to our clients, but it is going to be more than just gathering information for their release. It is gonna be discussion about the facts of the case because at these hearings, we can raise issues as to the legality of the rest and collection of evidence. Um, so that may require investigators to go out and interview witnesses and survey the scene so that we can make these arguments at the hearings. Based upon the amount of discovery that we anticipate that we are going to be receiving and the um, legal issues that will be raised at these hearings, we don't believe that we will be able to put in brand new attorneys into this courtroom. They are going to have to be attorneys that will be able to, to view this discovery and quickly pick out the issues that will be necessary to argue for the judge. So we would be asking for two dedicated, experienced attorneys to handle these hearings, one in and one investigator. So as um, I feel like a broken, just repeating what Ms. Mosser has said a lot, but same issues. Um, the, and this goes to the fact that our budget is 77% of our budget is salary and wages. We don't, in the budget right now, we do not have uh, the funds to take on these additional mandates and how they increase our needs throughout our office. So it's not just personnel, but it's also office space. We are currently at capacity for offices as part of um, the juvenile court build out, which, which is going to be a phenomenal thing for the county, but we did lose two offices as part of that new build out. Uh, so we were already down two offices and then adding uh, additional attorneys, we are at capacity. As part uh, beyond space um, is the technology that goes along with adding um, more, more staff. All of our attorneys have laptops so that they are able to remote into court as well as able in the courtroom to access the clerk system. Our, the laptops that they have currently are three years, are over three years old and their warranties have expired. Uh, so um, that makes it very difficult for them to, to be fixed if there are any issues with them. It also goes to the desktop cameras that allows them to Zoom. So to Zoom with their clients at the jail, to Zoom with clients out of custody. Those cameras are also over three years old and starting to malfunction. Office wide over all of our um, locations, we are starting to see that our office equipment um, is becoming outdated. And a couple of times we have been told malfunctioning beyond repair. So those are issues that we are going to have going forward. And um, 
Same as with the state's attorney's office and with the sheriff's office, these body worn cameras are going to create data storage issues and the need for increased data storage, as well as um, better uses of sharing discovery. So as those issues affect the state's attorney's office, they do affect the public defender's office as well. Unfortunately, it's difficult to pinpoint costs for our space and technology needs, but those are uh, things that are going to pop up in the future. And that is my presentation. All right, so is everybody hanging in there okay? <laughs> good, good. All right. No. Just one ray of sunshine after another. Yeah, well... A couple different things. The way that we're going to split up our presentation is I wanted to just uh, comment on the other ones that you've heard, and then I'm going to turn it over to Miss O'Brien, and she's going to go through our presentation. But um, I just want to spend about five Speaking, minutes. Speaking, please. This is uh, Judge, Judge Hall. Chief Judge Hall. Thank you, Chief. Yep. I, I just want to start out by just commenting on some of the things that you've heard already. Um, so first of all, uh, Ms. Cohen had said it best, and I think you've heard it over and over, but um, we're only as good as our weakest link. Uh, we, we as a system <clears throat> rise, rise and fall together on this. And so from the court system's perspective, from the chief judge's perspective, I don't have the staff and the, uh, the needs that everybody else that you've heard. And, and Ms. O'Brien will talk about that. But the reason that I want to bring up on that rise and fall together is because if the offices that are here before you don't get the support, then the court system can't do what it needs to do. And so um, I'm fully supportive and appreciate all the hard work that everybody has put into their presentations um, because, uh, you know, again, I think that one concern would be is, you know, are we, are we trying to, to scare you? Um, we're not. Um, you know, the, the reality is it's, it's scary when we look forward to this and see the needs, um, what they look like. The second thing I want to say about that is, um, and I've heard the chair and I've heard Madam Chair talk about this, but, you know, there's been a there's been a push in the past to change the criminal justice system. I've been a part of the criminal justice system since 1993. Um, until the last couple of years, there was a lot of talk, but there was not a lot of action. In the last couple of years, for a lot of different reasons, there's a sea change that's occurring. And, and now what we're seeing is that that's happening. There's a concern about mental health. There's a concern about... Uh, the, the way the system operates, but the reality and the hard part for the county board, and I think not just for you, but for county boards across the state, is that with this sea change um, comes new programming, uh, comes new demands. And as a result of all that, there is an additional, uh, additional funds, a lot of funds that are going to be needed to do that, number one. And then number two, there are things that have been in place that have funded these in the past that are no longer going to be there the bonds, the fines and costs that can go to the county to support this. So it really is a double whammy in that one is you're losing revenue that you've always had before. And number two, you're now being asked to have new programs that are going to cost you money. And again, uh, you know, the hard part is that if Springfield does not give you the money to do this, where does the money come from? Um, so that's why I think we're, we're here. Um, and I, and I applaud all the changes, uh, I applaud what the sheriff is doing, uh, what the state's attorney is doing, and trying to incorporate all these changes. Um, but the bottom line is it's, they all come with a price. Um, with that, before I turn it over to Ms. O'Brien, there's a couple things that I just want to emphasize, starting first with Sheriff Hain, uh, when he talked about the unknowns. Um, Illinois is going to be one of the first states in the entire country to go to a cashless bail, bail system. Um, he talks about, you know, the, the thought is while the jail population is going to go down, there's also a concern that the jail population may go up because now a judge, instead of imposing a dollar amount of, say, $500 or $1,000, um, and, and that person can then post and be released, the judge is now going to be in a position to decide, is that person somebody that should be in? or should be out regardless of that money. So just to use an example of domestic batteries, uh, people who commit domestic battery typically come in front of a judge and that bail amount for a first time DUI offender may be somewhere between 500 to $1,000. Um, now, when that person comes in front of the judge, the judge is gonna have to hear the facts of the domestic battery 
and then make a decision as to whether based upon public safety and risk to that individual who was the victim of the domestic battery, whether that person should be in or whether they should be out. And so uh, again, no one can predict how that's gonna go, but um, there is a possibility that in the beginning, we're gonna see the jail population bump up. Another thing that statewide they've been concerned about is on EHM, the idea of EHM um, is only to use EHM when it has to be used. Um, there is discussion and concern that the way that EHM will be used is to give judges um, kind of a fail safe so that we will uh, order a lot more EHM because if we can't post a bail or have them post a bail, we'll want to put them on EHM. And, and then that's really not the intent of the entire statute. So, so again, there's a lot of unknowns and things that we can't predict. And we're going to go in this ready to work as hard as we can, but there's no way to look at you right now and tell you how this is going to work because we don't know. Um, so that's, that's a hard part. Um, the next is, as we talk about the staffing needs uh, that Ms. Mossers indicated, that uh, Ms. Cohen, uh, from, from all of us, and, and what you're going to hear is, um, the reality is, is that as we do that, and they're needed, uh, there is no space. Uh, and I appreciate, the, I appreciate what Madam Chair and the entire county board has done by having uh, White and Company come around and assess our space. And I think that when you hear from them, what you'll hear is that again, we're not trying to raise an alarm that's not, that doesn't need to be raised. Um, when you walk through our buildings, you can understand that we've taken closets and made them offices. We've taken any available, any, yeah, any available space. And so as this, as we increase our headcount, we don't have some, we don't have any place to put them. And I understand that's a huge ask of the county board and it's a long term. But as it relates to the presentation from the chief judges, you know, in the court system, um, it's just the reality is that we have to figure out when new employees are hired, where is it that they're going to go? Um, and then finally, I just, I just want to just one final note before I turn it over is to talk about um, what Ms. Conant talked about with that PD and state's attorney salary disparity. I know it's, it's a very small issue and, and when you're hearing a lot of big ones, but as small as that request is, it's a huge one to, to me as the chief judge. It's a huge one to the system because it's not, <clears throat> it's not a situation where I know that the county is going through a, a salary review of how do, we, how do we assess our salaries, what are our salaries compared to others. This is within our very own county. And this is an inequity um, between people doing the same work and, uh, and ultimately, I have great confidence, uh, not only in our system, but also in all of you, that we'll be able to address that. Because it's very, very hard um, to explain to an assistant public defender why, based upon doing the same amount of work, they're getting paid less. And, uh, and that's one that I just feel very strongly about. And, and, and I appreciate your listening and giving us an opportunity to talk about all of this, but also that as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. O'Brien. One of the great things about being the chief judge is uh, having wonderful people that work on your behalf. And so Ms. O'Brien has taken this on and uh, she's going to be the one that gives our PowerPoint presentation. Morning. Okay. Uh, as everyone has already stated, apologize. It's, can everyone hear me? Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Um, as everyone has stated, you know, we're all in this together. The Safety Act is an unfunded mandate um, that we're required to implement, and it affects us all differently, but equally, uh, it's important that we all come into it uh, in, in a, you know, a joint effort. Um, specifically for the courts, there are two areas of main impact. Um, the first one is the need to rework our existing bond call courtroom. There we go. Um, with cashless bail coming into place and now the requirement of pretrial detention hearings, um, there's a need to rework an existing courtroom that we use for bond call. Um, pretrial or detention hearings are required for most criminal cases. Uh, these hearings, as everyone has stated, are required to be in person. Uh, because they're required to be in person, we have to have access to the lockup uh, so that inmates can appear in person as well. The hearings that um, are involved are quite lengthy. They can be complex. Uh, in order to accommodate our um, 
potential volume, uh, we're going to have to transition the call to a full day call five days a week instead of a morning call. With that transition then, currently in courtroom 005, other cases are heard besides bond call cases. So we have to have another location for those to go. To accommodate the number of orders of protection, other cases we hear in there as well, um, we're proposing a build out of our multi-purpose room at the King County Judicial Center, which is room 001. Um, this should provide us with the needed space that we need to accommodate another court call. Um, it's not sufficient to have other cases heard in the existing courtrooms because the volumes are already heavy. Uh, the build out would require, um, as any standard courtroom, the, the judges bench, monitors, cameras, speakers. Uh, it would also require additional staff. We'll have to have a judge staff that courtroom. We'll also have to have a bailiff. And as other departments have stated, there will be need to have attorneys, circuit clerks, and possibly court security as well. We are in the process of working with White and Company uh, to develop a courtroom plan. Uh, and so they're doing that now and working on cost estimates. The second impact of the Safety Act is the need for technology updates in all courtrooms and technology upgrades. Uh, the Safety Act requires all law enforcement officers to wear body cams. Uh, the ability to present these body cams have to be available during motions, bench trials, and jury trials that require additional technology that we don't have. Besides the Safety Act requiring additional technology and equipment, to hear these matters, uh, our Illinois Supreme Court has come out kind of with their, their clear expectation that all courts in Illinois should continue allow to, for remote and in-person hearings as well. This will require more permanent technology in the courtrooms like mounted monitors, permanent cameras, updated speakers, and AV systems for evidence presentation. Uh, we have submitted uh, an American Rescue Plan a request for funds, we did that back in October uh, in the amount of 1.67 million and that would, um, if granted, cover the cost for these needs. The last item I just wanna mention, you've heard it from uh, several departments already, uh, is the need for increases in salaries, contractuals, commodities, uh, line items for our 2022 budget and the ability to allow for capital expenditures. Uh, like all departments, we've been struggling with hiring, attracting, retaining good qualified staff. Uh, we're currently short bailiffs. Um, we provide bailiffs in most of our courtrooms. Um, we'll also need additional bailiffs, bailiffs to staff courtroom 001, which will be our new order of protection courtroom. Uh, along with bailiffs, we are short law clerks. Typically we staff six law clerk positions. We have three staff attorneys and three paralegals. By the end of this month, we will be down to one paralegal. We have posted on Indeed, we have posted through the county, through law schools, schools that have paralegal programs. And unfortunately we have just been, you know, not been able to attract and hire qualified employees. Um, Along with salaries, we also are asking that we have an increase in commodities and contractuals um, because adequate funding is necessary to supply the courts with the services and equipment to run the courts. Um, and the costs and services, as everyone knows, continues to increase. We also have a need to update our um, existing jury assembly rooms. Uh, we would need additional technological capabilities um, for people to you know, be there all day, plug in for phones, tablets, computers, which we don't currently have. Um, so the need is um, present. Uh, and so we're asking for those increases as well. That is all I have for judiciary. Okay, we're gonna move on to uh, court services, Ms. Ost. Good morning. Good morning, thank you, that works. All right, um, 
when I was thinking about how to do this morning's presentation, really, I keep going back to, we do a pretty, I do a pretty comprehensive uh, budget request every single year. And so what I really did was I took the budget presentation I gave you last August, and then I updated it for today. So a lot of this information will be substantially the same. I'm not going to go back over it in depth because we've had those conversations, but I've updated the slides as we go just to bring it current. Um, so in thinking about what the information was that you wanted to hear about today, I did review the committee of the whole um, that you had on in February on the 22nd. And I heard very clearly the outline of what these potential new funds could fund. Um, and so it was described, you know, public safety, mental health, buildings and grounds and transportation. So court services, as you all know, we've talked about over the years, were really a, a broad umbrella for three distinct different functions within the county. We do juvenile detention, which then clearly fits. We have our mental health section through the diagnostic center, um, and as well as probation and pretrial, which is, again, falls under public safety. And so this slide is just emphasizing that. I'm not going to go through the whole structure, but you can see it, whatever the county decides to do as far as funding and where you're going to put your funds, um, just don't forget to do a deep dive within each department because each different section of court services does address some aspect of mental health. I have mental health clinicians at, in juvenile detention. I have a diagnostic center that does um, merit commission psychological evals for new sheriff's officers. So we're all um, continuing on that theme. We're all interrelated and interconnected and we're all dependent on each other and we all support each other. So this is the, oh, wow, that slide came out really funny. Um, we're all, or this, so this is the slide that I presented to you back in last August. And so you can see the budget request that I made at that time. So in the red at the bottom, if you're considering all of court services to be eligible for whatever your new funding stream might be, um, I'm adding in a 10% uh, inflation for the bottom line. And we've all seen the projections that we're expecting anything from 7.5, 7.9 to 10% inflation over the next year. And in fact, I will say for my department, I've already seen a 16% increase in my gasoline expenditures just in the last 30 days. Um, so really this, this is bearing out. Um, I'm also giving you foreshadowing. Again, that came out really goofy that um, we, the probation and detention union, union contract is up in eight months. Um, so, so not only are we needing to look at the bottom line budget, but a, a additionally the foreshadowing of what is coming up. And that is going to be a, a big consideration for my contract. I'm sorry that the um, labels did not work out, but that blue slice of the pie represents just the union um, salaries. That's not benefits. That's not management, that is just the union staff. And so over the years, as the county has restricted um, increases in expenditures, and in fact, we've experienced some budget cuts, we've really focused on cutting commodities and contractual and trying to save our people, which is why I think that we're well-placed for um, implementing the new pretrial act. But that means that 89% of the budget then is people, it's personnel costs. And almost 50% of my personnel costs are union costs. And as I said, the union contract is up. And so that's something that the county needs to be aware of. Um, when I look at my staff turnover, it's been, it's increased during the pandemic for sure. So last year we had over a 20% turnover. That's primarily among the line staff, my union workers. And so when I look at the probation, the detention officers and where they <laughs> fall as far as comparables, you could see they're quite low on the list of comparables. Um, I would say the closest comparable to a detention officer would be a corrections officer at the jail. Um, I will note that probation officers and detention officers are required to have a bachelor's degree. Sheriff officers are not. <clears throat> and yet we're paid significantly less. Even if, uh, again, using just that 10% inflation rate, even if that were to be added to their salaries, it would still not match what the sheriff's department pays, though the responsibilities are substantially similar. Um, again, I 
am putting this out there for the county to absorb because that is going to impact the bottom line. Um, if the county were to narrowly focus um, what it wanted to fund and definitions of what programs are, um, again, I believe that court services would fit um, most adequately under the public safety um, aspect. Part of what public or pub, part of what court services does is pretrial, and that is directly related to the Safety Act. In 2020, we did over 3,000 bond reports. The state of Illinois is currently in the process of developing what the new bond report format is going to look like. Currently, what is being debated is adding a interview component, as well as the structure of what the new bond reports will look like. Right now, what we're using is called the public safety assessment. I've done presentations on that previously. And the public safety assessment, I'm able to do based largely off of past criminal history. It does not require an in-person interview. If the state of Illinois proceeds with requiring that everyone needs to get an in-person interview, which it looks like I'm in the 85% percentile assured rate, it's gonna go that way. Then we're gonna to have to look at interviewing all of those 3000 people before bond call. And so are the initial appearance. And so I'm not sure what that structure is gonna look like yet. Cause as I said, they're in the process of developing it now. They've just hired um, a contractor to develop that for them. And, and I'm guessing it's gonna be anywhere between a 15 to 25 minute conversation. And so you can imagine if you just do simple math on that, I have to interview them all. Um, before they, they go to that initial appearance. Right now, my officers get to work at 5.30 in the morning. And so we've, uh, the chief judge's office has set up a, a committee with different representatives on it. And so we're looking at what is that timeline? How long will it take the state's attorney to do their new requirements, me to do my new requirements, the public defender. And so we're, we're building up that timeline for when our people will need to start. And unfortunately, we're looking at bond call might have to start later in the day, which means it will finish later in the day. And again, it, it, it just pushes the whole process back. So there will be more to come on that. For juvenile probation, um, again, getting back away from the Safety Act, but more towards global public safety, um, this is information I've presented to you in the past of the different police um, agencies that we work with in the county, all of them, all 26 jurisdictions, as well as agencies outside of the county. Um, it is well, it is within uh, the Juvenile Court Act that a juvenile could commit an offense outside of the county and yet be prosecuted inside of the county because they live here. So under the Juvenile Court Act, a minor could be prosecuted either where they live or where the offense occurred. And so that's why you see so many different agencies that we work with um, on those for those minors, as well as you can see a listing of or a pie graph. <laughs> representing the different kinds of offenses that the juveniles have. Back, yeah. um, for our juvenile detention, again, you can see they, they hold a lot of kids. Um, they only hold the offenses that are the most serious offenses. Again, juvenile detention is listed as something that would cleanly fit under the realm of public safety. Um, when talking about juvenile detention, it also would fall under um, the category of buildings and grounds and capital expenditures for the county. That building is about 25 years old. It needs some maintenance. Um, there has not been a lot of uh, exterior maintenance, for example, done on that building. You can see that we have uh, some water intrusions happening. That, that upper right-hand photo shows rust stains from a window that are falling down on the inside of the building. Um, the windows that are the center bottom, you can see there's some rust stains happening around those on the exterior of the building. You can see where the paint um, has faded and, and fallen off of the building. So there's some exterior maintenance things that need to be done as well, um, as well as you know basic capital such as new washers and dryers. Some of those are original or, or pretty close to when the building opened, as well as you can see cracking and um, where the walls are, are starting to shift. You know that building's 25 years old, it's just going to settle over time and it needs some, it needs some attention. Um, I also want to let you guys know that we still have an outstanding issue of the berm. So when the new facility was built, 
uh, that houses the coroners, um, as well as some building and grounds and um, some of the sheriff's uh, equipment is over there. It is situated directly across from the external recreation pen for the Juvenile Justice Center. We had requested that a berm be built, but you can see where that red circle is, the berm did not extend to um, obscure viewing of the juveniles from the coroner side of the building, the coroner's public entrance. It is a, a statute, there is regulations that the juveniles have to be shielded from sight and view by adults. Um, and so that is an outstanding issue that still needs to be addressed. Um, additionally, probation is, is looking at some capital expenditures, not a whole lot. I'm, I'm very grateful to the county that uh, you provided us with new cars um, when the pandemic began and um, the probation officers really put a focus on doing more increased home visits and doing the majority of our work in the field with the defendants in the field. It kept the defendants um, out of the courthouse. Um, it kept our officers able to continue to work remotely and in the field as well. Um, and we felt like that was really important, especially in terms of the pandemic to meet with people outside, um, sit standing on the front stoop of their house. And so we needed the vehicles to do that, but they're aging. We have some aging cars that are going to need to be replaced. Um, wow, I have no idea what has happened. So I'll just forward. Um, one of the things I wanted to touch on was the Diagnostic Center. Dr. Sang has presented in the past on the work that the Diagnostic Center does. Um, they provide not only um, risk assessments for the court, such as, you know, is the defendant uh, sane or, or fit to stand trial? Did the defendant understand what their Miranda rights were at the time of the arrest? But they also provide evaluations for staffing, such as they do um, psychological evaluations for KINGCOM, uh, for the sheriff's office, for corrections, as well as handling those critical incidents when there's a significant death or, or, or a any um, work-related incident happens where that officer needs to be debriefed and, and have an immediate crisis response or intervention, KCDC um, is called out and they do provide those. They also do some therapy. They've done over a thousand plus hours of therapy a year. They tend to focus more on our specialty court um, and, and to work with those individuals because they have very high risk and very high needs. Um, we also have specialty courts that specifically work with like our drug offenders, our drug court, but our mental health court as well. And we work very intensively with um, that clientele. So just in conclusion, we're, we're not quite done assessing how the Safety Act is going to exactly impact court services. I believe that I have enough personnel for what the act requires today. But as the state of Illinois continues to uh, drill down on the standards for what the interviews and the whole bond report process will be, I may have to come back and reevaluate our department and the programs that we provide. Um, I am projecting a 10% increase in inflation. Our contracts are up. That's over 50% of my budget. Um, I fully anticipate that the union will come back with a rather high number given the inflation rates. So I just want to make sure that that's on your radar. And that's what I have. I have a money's all gone. Yeah. If you don't, you don't get it. What money? Yeah. <laughs> Play money. Madam Chair, did you have something? Uh, yes, I have a request before if there's any other comments. I'm sure there'll be some conversation that may uh, tumble out of this uh, incredible presentation. As I said, I feel like we've been pounded. Um, and we, we have one more to go. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so if we can, if we can. It's if, short. It's okay. short. I, I didn't, I didn't go into detail. Do what Teresa says, if that's okay, then maybe we'll take a, a five minute pause yeah. to gather thoughts. <laughs> Teresa, <laughs> Clerk Barrero, sorry, go ahead. Thank you. Sorry to inform you, but yes, there is one more presentation. It's pretty fast though, maybe. I, I have more. <laughs> Oh, okay, let's go back.
Okay. So what I focused on was basically the bail reform and the two new courtrooms, which are now actually four new courtrooms when you think about it. Um, so what we have here is our um, cash bail analysis from 2019. I left that up there on purpose because that's kind of how much how our funding is right now and our um, our budget is we're, we're a couple of years behind everyone else. So I wanted to keep the 2019 up there just as a reminder of how far we are here at the circuit clerk's office behind. And I'm just like everyone, our, my employees are just like everyone else that is experiencing um, not being able to hire, um, losing staff to other areas. Um, I believe our clerical staff is actually the lowest paid in Kane County. So if you look at that, we, we collect um, fines and fees um, and court costs paid to the state at 869,964. The fines and co court costs paid to the clerk, county and local agencies totals 4,372,000. Uh, judgments of forfeitures to local agencies is about 92,660. And then we have previously for several years, obviously received the 530,000 in bond. So what we disperse to um, other local agencies, et cetera, is approximately 508, 5 million, I'm sorry, 865,649. Bond paid as private attorneys is 634,000. Bond paid as restitution is 222. There are 479 other local agencies throughout King County that receive these payment disbursements. This money does not just stay in King County, it, it, we, we forward it on. 479 agencies are gonna be hurting from this also. Um, with, with the Safety Act having all the um, positive things that it does have, it does have a cost um, tag to it that I don't think everyone is aware of. And I think that's why we're all here today to show the cost that this is going to um, uh, cost the, the King County, everybody, all the judicial partners in King County, not just my office. So in 2019, we paid 530,000 into um, the general fund for bond. That's 6,949 cases. The elimination of bond forfeiture and judgment of forfeiture was 92,660. So the warrant fees paid to, to law enforcement agencies was 95,000, 50,000 of that was the sheriff's portion. Warrant fees um, administrative portion paid to the circuit clerk's office was only 31,000 out of that 530,000. This is just a synopsis of the um, state legislation that uh, we are all looking at and going over. It's gonna affect all our, of our offices. One is the uh, vehicle code and the traffic um, assessment that's going forward. So that is going to be uh, another huge hit to the county's budget for not being able to collect on all the um, fines and fees in a traffic incident, you could only collect on one. This is just another, um, shows the different types of legislation that we are all gonna be faced with. Uh, the first one is failure to pay a satisfaction of failure to pay reporting to Secretary of State. What will happen is, Pe folks will get their driver's license back rather than having to come in and pay their fines and fees to get their driver's license. A uh, police officer will not be able to hold their driver's license. They do get it back. Um, the $75 warrant fee to agencies has been repealed. Uh, $30 a day credit for time served, repealed. Uh, pretrial release, collecting conditions of pretrial release and pretrial data collection, analyzing and reporting requirements. 
this requires uh, two additional, well, I've upped it to four for support staff. That includes the courtrooms that have just been added. The new um, uh, 005 uh, bond call court, and which could be an all day thing. Now it's gonna be two courtrooms. It's gonna be an all day thing. Sometimes our staff can come back to the office and work for half a day or work for a few hours and get work done that, that they would have to do while they're in court also, because they essentially are doing two jobs. Um, my staff is, the starting pay is $15 an hour. We have currently 92 employees, 65 are union and 27 are non-union. We are currently in negotiations, union contract negotiation, negotiations. Our contract was up December 1st. Um, so of course you will see me coloring my hair a lot more regularly, but it's, it's just you know part of the job. But it's, un, it's unfortunate because the, we have lost so many employees. We are down 20% plus also. Um, since I took office, and our staff is literally divided into two groups. We have uh, under, we have about 25 employees under a year, under a year in our, in the circuit clerk's office. What that means is it takes about a year to get trained to get to a courtroom. So we're, we're kind of um, doing a puzzle piece uh, of how to train employees to get people in the courtroom. They're jumping all over the place. Um, it's hard to, for them to be trained correctly. It's hard on supervisors and it's hard on the public that comes in when an employee um, cannot assist them. So that's something that I think the county really needs to take into consideration. We start at $15 an hour. Um, everybody knows my thoughts on that. And we, so we have, according to this, we have uh, two programming analysis um, openings, and those are at 54,000 each. We also have uh, a need for four uh, support staff and courtrooms at 39,000. Then we have a need for the two additional clerks, they'll be in the two new courtrooms. Now that granted, this is just to operate the court system. This is not extra employees sitting around eating bonbons. This is just enough staff to man the courts. And we don't have that right now. So this is an analysis of what that will cost the county going forward. Um, even though I do have Four of those, I believe, in my budget currently, we are we cannot even fill the regular um, positions that we have open. So we are we are currently today having a virtual job fair. So hopefully, we'll get some applicants out of that. So this is what minus the five mil, uh, five hundred thousand in uh, bond bail bond that the county will no longer receive. Uh, if you could see, we have 2022 in there. That would be the, the grand total from the circuit clerk's office um, and to pay for, this is just employees. We move it to 2023, it's, it's 439, 439,000. Now in 2023, we eliminate the 500,000 that the county gets. This is out of the general fund. So as you go on, you can see it's, it's only going to add the 500,000 to the grand total I'm, of just for staff. It's something that they have to consider. The circuit clerk's office gets $31,000 a year out of that 500. That's more than one clerk makes in one year. So these are some more bills that um, <laughs> unfortunately we have to look at um, that are tagged on to the Safety Act. Uh, the, these, there's two pages. It was actually eight pages that I received from the AOIC. And each one of these bills has something that the circuit clerk's office is going to, some type of clerical duties that the circuit clerk's office is going to have to uh, function 
in order, to, uh, that's what these bills are. So that's just more work um, for the circuit clerk's office, uh, which we are not, um, this isn't not, this isn't news to any of us. This usually comes down the, the pike, but um, these are bills that we do have to pay attention to. And we're not sure what each one of those might add to the costs that we already have. So it's just something I wanted to show you. Um, I know I'm working with the state's attorney's office now to try and understand which bills and what bills and the importance of each one, but every single one of them has something that the circuit clerk's office has, has to um, add into their daily functions. And that's it. Short, short I told you. All right, that, that was a, a lot of information in the last few hours. Um, I, it's up to the committee. Did you wanna take a short break and then come back on questions? We can just push through. Mr. Leonard wants to just push through, I'm, I'm agreeable. Okay, so basically our task um, for our judicial partners was, um, the task was show us what your needs are, show us where we're, um, our funding is, where there's a gap of funding. Um, our judicial partners have always exp explained their needs um, the Safety Act just highlights and impacts a need that it's it's going to be law. These are things that we're going to have to do. We don't have a choice whether or not we want to do them. They're going to be done. Um, and like, you know, our good partners that they are, they've always brought not just what we what they need, but how we can fund it. So um, the opportunity to use this 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 tax to fund these needs um, that we need to do is out there. So that's going to be the to ask for the county board. And I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Leonard because I know he's been working closely on this too. And he, as a prior chair has experience. So Mr. Leonard, go ahead with your comments. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. First of all, I'd like to thank everyone for the presentation. You know, I've always said we have to define needs versus wants. These are all needs. They're not wants, they're mandated. We understand that. I think, um, being absolutely candid about things. Can we fund all of these right away? No, and you're not asking for that. You're asking for funding over a period of time to get up to the mandated requirements. And I respect that very much. And we will have to find a way to do that over a few years. Um, the one issue that I do wanna bring up that I've spoken to a number of people about and that I think is immediate and that we need to do right now is we need to fund that $251,000. And I like seeing Madam Chair nod her head, yes. I've spoken with her. I've spoken with uh, our committee, Madam Chair. I've spoken with the Chair of Finance and I've spoken to probably a dozen county board members and we are all in agreement. How do we fund it? Well, there are a couple of different ways, but it's not a lot of money. It's $251,000. We do have an audit coming through. We had talked about that a little bit. And I think that is the most immediate way to fund that discrepancy. Discrepancy isn't even fair. It's a, an inequality and injustice to all the public defenders uh, in our county. And, you know, we have the support of the chief judge. We have the support of the state's attorney who is saying it's not fair. So, you know, we have the understanding and I think we have the the support of the board to get that done. How we handle all the other increases, we're gonna to have to work on that, it'll take us time. Um, and fortunately, we don't have to do it all right now. So we'll all work together to try to get that resolved. But right now, I wanna make sure that um, hopefully once we get our final audit figures through, we have enough money to fund that discrepancy immediately because that is something that has to be done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Madam Chair, would you like to speak? Uh, yes, please. Um, I've asked all the other presenters uh, to do the same, what I'm about to ask you, although you're going to be a little bit more complicated because you have much more of a complex situation. Um, we're going to be meeting, the board will be meeting on the 22nd to discuss which way they would like to consider moving forward as a potential opportunity for funding from the uh, countywide sales tax. Uh, so in order to abbreviate all of this that you put forward. If you could put together, I would say each one of you, perhaps a page or half page summary statement 
with your costs. We really need to get your bottom line costs. And what I'd like to know is what your budget is right now and what your future needs are so we can clearly identify what the gaps are. That will then be presented to the entire board as all the other one pagers will be presented. So we have a reference point to discuss for notes um, when we meet on the 22nd. So if you can get that um, maybe about a week, at least three or four days before, I would like a week, but I know everybody's busy, um, just to solidify that so that we have that information. Mr. Leonard. Yes, Mr. Leonard. Um, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, if possible, too, it'd be nice if when we get that report from all the different divisions and departments that it's uh, given out to all the county board members oh, it, so no, that absolutely. when we have the meeting on the 22nd, everyone's had a chance to review it and they're Every, informed everyone's on what's going to get on. everything. Wonderful. <laughs> is this a special county board meeting on the 22nd? On the 22nd, it is a special county board meeting. Is it at 9.30 or 9.45? It is in the afternoon. Um, it's under discussion right now whether it's going to start at 3.30 or 4, uh, but uh, you'll be notified plenty of time. It's scheduled right now for 3.30. Anybody else have a question? Mr. Uh, Brown, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Brown speaking. I think one of the things I'd like to try to get an answer on before we get to that board meeting is, and it's been mentioned here a little bit, out of these four different buckets that we're talking about, what, how can you work between one bucket and the other? For example, is some of this public safety request something that could fall under the mental health is some of the building requests that we're talking about here does that come into the bucket of the buildings and, and infrastructure improvements i mean how 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 can these different requests intertwine between each other um, i think that's an exceptionally if i may an exceptionally good question and um i would like to have our um perhaps michelle nearman or, or Vince Coyle, oh, or, or our state's attorney. <laughs> so the, the way that this tax was designed is that when you put it on the ballot, it can only be for one of the four topics. So that if public safety is chosen, then the money that is received from the special tax would only go to fund public safety. Now, I think kind of what you're alluding to also, though, and I believe it was presented very well with Ms. Aust, is there's a lot of stuff in public safety that also has to deal with mental health, that also has to deal with that. And so it could fall under the umbrella of public safety, it, and it could deal with some of these other issues. So that's how it happens. We just have to make sure that it's under that classification. Right. Mm -hmm. So a follow up on that, if I could. I, could there be two different referendums put out only not one. at the same only, election we can Correct. only put out one on that on that one election right so okay. if this year we put it out and we put it at 0.25 or 0.5 whichever we choose to do and it's only for one it would be for one of the four next year we could do it again and ask to put it up for 0.75 you know which would then go to a whole different one but the voters have to clearly vote for a referendum and we can only put one at a time and, and that's only at um, a proposed election. election. So probably the next one would be going out on the presidential election because the, the, mm -hmm. the next election cycle will simply be for local elections, school boards, mayors. Right. And Question, Shepro. Um, I'll let Mr. Shepro go and then I'll... Mr. Shepro, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. First, I, I would share in the... Uh, Compliments to everyone for the time that was put into these presentations. I think they are, I think every one of them, uh, as Mr. Davis said, is, is deeply disturbing in terms of uh, where we are and where we have to go. And I also agree with Mr. Leonard's comments uh, that we have to focus on uh, what we must do, not what we'd like to do. And I guess, and a couple of concerns. One is um, we always seem to have these great presentations and then we look at the clock and it's 1130 and we don't have time to do what I think uh, all of us ought to have. I think lots of questions that come out of these presentations. 
And while I like the idea in theory of a nice one page summary, so much of the information that was presented today, I honestly don't know how you could really do justice, no pun intended, to it <laughs> by trying to put it all you know, on one page for, for each of these um, uh, departments. And the, I suppose one thing that hit me most about virtually every presentation is most of the costs, many of the costs, an unknown amount of the costs are unknown. And I don't see any likelihood that we are going to discover that uh, by the committee of the whole meeting. And so the premise of a lot of what we wanna do uh, and through no fault of anybody who's been very diligent, um, we don't know the answers and we don't know when we will find out the answers. So that's just sort of one observation. I guess the second one is that uh, it was nobly said yesterday that this process is not designed to pit one department against another department, but the fact is whether that's the intent or not, that's the reality. Uh, we've got, as the state's attorneys noted, we've got four different buckets uh, and there's some overlap, but there are very clear rules and we can't do everything. So this board is going to have to choose, uh, make some difficult choices between what some of the wonderful ideas for new programs. Uh, when this tax question was first brought up, it seemed to me that we were looking at using that to fund potentially uh, gaps in our revenue uh, that we were going to need to cover uh, the projections for next year. And I know Madam Chair has spoken about the need to have a backup budget. If this does not pass, where are we going to get the, uh, you know, the $13 million that we would otherwise get? 26 if we decide to go for a, a half a cent. Uh, so I think that discussion uh, is gonna be a serious one. So I have a few specific questions though. I think this is for everybody who presented, but maybe for the state's attorney. So we were talking about the fact that there are now criminal penalties for things like wrongfully or, or, or putting in false information. Um, my question, I guess for everybody, but maybe for Jamie in particular, are there penalties for not putting in false information, but for failing to have all the information. Uh, we kind of alluded to this before. If we have to keep certain records and we don't have enough funding to keep them all, what are the consequences that flow from that? I think they are serious. Another question, I'll just ask a, several of these and maybe people could answer as they have time. So I agree with Mr. Leonard and the others that the, the funding differential, not just between the state's attorney and the public defender, but all of our judicial people and other counties um, is immense. And we keep hearing every month, we lose more people. They're going elsewhere. And we need to hire replacements. And I guess my question is, or maybe particularly just the public defender because she made a point about it, where do we get the people who are going to come in and take the senior jobs that have been vacated? Presumably, they're not coming here for the pay. Uh, if, they could, if they wanted the pay, they'd go to Lake County. So uh, does that mean we're getting people who can't find jobs anywhere else? Or are we just not getting anybody who wants the job? It seems to me that that problem accelerates every year as the differential gets bigger. And as was pointed out, I think even this morning, there was another report on inflation that it was the most in 40 years. And a lot of our assumptions 
about future costs were based on a 2% assumption. So uh, I have so many more questions, but uh, those are the ones that occur to be, to me, to be the most urgent. And I guess I just conclude by saying that I think a lot of the presentations that we heard yesterday as desirable as it might be to have some of those, I just don't see how they play any part of the discussion with the types of information and problems that we, we heard this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sharpro. Um, Mr. Leonard, did you have? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to make one more comment. And I think Mr. Brown uh, brought up this issue. And once again, I'd like to show my bias and prejudice for the Judicial and Public Safety uh, Division. But, you know, there are four different areas that this referendum could um, direct itself to uh, public safety, mental health, transportation, and buildings. And I think Judicial and Public Safety recognizes three of those issues in their one division. So, you know, just from a personal standpoint, and I know this is bias and prejudice, if in fact we do go forward with this, I think we should use judicial and public safety as our criteria on the a referendum because it does satisfy three of the four uh, requests. Thank you, Mr. Leonard. Um, I guess just a question, because I've, I've had a couple of people ask me this question, um, Ms. Mosser. What if we don't follow the Safety Act? What happens? What happens if the county says, you know what, we don't have the money, we can't fund this mandate? Well, I would think somebody would come in and force us to do it. And that could be a variety of ways. One would be a, a writ of mandamus, which I don't even want to go about explaining at this point. I think if we receive any type of federal funding, that could be in danger. I think then there could also be lawsuits for us not following the law in the way that we should. And that is a concerning thing there. Um, as mentioning to my earlier presentation, there was a lawsuit that happened in another state when they weren't prosecuting a certain type of cases, which were the child pro pornography cases. They weren't investigating it and a child got hurt. That county got sued. So if we do not follow the law, we are opening ourselves up to a lot of liability. Thank you. Criminal and penalties? Just, yes. Mm -hmm. And I ask that because I think it's important for us to just kind of shift our focus. Um, this is something that the county will have to implement. Where we get the funding is the question, whether or not it's gonna come as a forced tax from our property taxes or whether or not it's gonna be a choice tax. That's really the question here. Um, so I will let Madam Chair have the last word and then um, we'll move to end this meeting. Uh, thank you. Um, we have an opportunity here uh, to, as a board, to really reach out to our constituents, uh, to our neighbors, the people who shop here in Kane County, who want to do business here in Kane County, uh, to help fund judicial public safety. I think we're probably, um, all of us are very, I, I, I am very much paused and uh, heartbroken about the lack of funding that we have provided to the courts. Um, it, it bothers me deeply. Now, I know we can. Uh, on two, up to three, up to four options uh, for this countywide sales tax. It can be 25 cents on a $100 purchase, it can be 50 cents on a $100 purchase, or up at quarter in increments. And I've seen it as high as $1.50 per $100 purchase, which I think is uh, for our taste a little bit extreme, but nonetheless could possibly be necessary, uh, which is why I asked for uh, a brief summary. I think it's very important that we are realistic, even though we are all fiscally prudent. Democrats and Republicans on this board are highly fiscally prudent, very cautious about tax. But we should not ask for what we think the taxpayers will get by with. At this point in time, with all due respect to our taxpayers, and I mean this in all sincerity, we have to ask for what we need because if we underfund this, we are gonna go back to property tax increases, which are still not going to be adequate enough to fund the great need 
that has been accrued over a number of years. We're talking about 10 years of potential underfunding. And I speak, have spoken with previous county board chairs and they're stunned about what has happened to the county. So I, I think we have to really get careful consideration of what we're gonna be funding. And I'm gonna ask you, thank you for your honesty with these presentations and bringing these numbers to us. But I want to make sure that the board sees the reality so that we know when we're looking at if we're gonna be doing this or capital improvements or roads, um, that we adequately fund those and we look towards the future and realize that if somebody comes in, and I'm not being sarcastic with this, if somebody comes into one of our great stores and buys a Louis Vuitton bag, which people buy, women love Louis Vuitton bags, and spend $2,000 on that bag, that that individual who purchased that bag for a gift or for their own use will really be able to afford that 25 cents or that 50 cents on that $100 purchase, because that's the kind of things we're looking at. So that's, that's my comment. Okay, thank you everybody for being here. I may have consensus to place our written reports on file. Madam Chair, Shepherd. Mr. Shepherd? Uh, do we still need to take action on, uh, there was I think a forwarded resolution that we didn't vote on uh, earlier? Um, no, the, the two resolutions um, from our um, public defender and uh, circuit clerk, they requested that we defer those uh, till our next meeting. Ah, thank you, sorry. You still need a motion for the reports and then consensus? Well, if no. so, then so moved. If there's without objection, they could be placed by consensus on file. Perfect. That, that took longer. <laughs> okay. Um, and a next item was executive session. We have none. Again, thank you all for your time. Uh, may I have a motion to adjourn? Davis moves. Jeffro seconds. Thank you, everybody. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next month. Thank you, Chairman.